Hey, everybody. Welcome to Rollback, where we share the best episodes from the pre-video audio-only RRP archive here on YouTube for the first time. Today's edition is, I got to tell you, one of the most compelling, inspirational, cautionary, and grippingly cinematic stories that I've ever heard in my entire life. It's the story of one John McAvoy, and it's going to blow your mind. By way of brief introduction, John was a guy who was born into this notorious London crime family. He eventually becomes a high profile armed bank robber as one does. He was then not surprisingly eventually busted and sentenced to life in prison. But through this insane series of just absolutely incredible events that I'm not gonna spoil, John ultimately pulls one of the greatest 180 degree life transformations of all time. Going from this life centered around crime to ultimately finding redemption in sport and along the way, breaking British and world indoor rowing records, becoming the only Nike sponsored Ironman athlete in the world. And he's a guy who continues to inspire countless people around the globe with his incredible story of personal evolution and his advocacy for prison reform all of which makes this conversation one of the most legendary in the history of this podcast. So buckle up and enjoy episode 379, recorded in the summer of 2018 with John McAvoy. And we're rolling. John, so good to uh, meet you, man. I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. So super stoked to have you share your story with me today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a huge honor and privilege, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, we're coming to everybody from a conference room in Shoreditch, London. It's a little cavernous in here, so it might sound a little bit uh, echoey in comparison to the way the podcast usually sounds, so you're just going to have to bear with it. But I think it's going to be all fine, right? Yeah. Because you're going to get so lost in John's story, you're, just, you're not even going to know what's happening. Um, before we even get into that, though, what are you, what are you training for right now? Um, so my season starts in three weeks' time. I'm racing Ironman Hamburg. Mm-hmm. Um, I was meant to be racing two weekends ago, but tr- obviously training for Ironman, you end up developing a lot of injuries, especially as I'm getting yeah. a bit older. So I had a problem with a tendon in my foot, so I had to delay to start my race season. But my season kicks off in three weeks' time in Germany. Cool, man. So, uh, feeling good? Injury-free? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm much better now. Um, I've been a bit more consistent with my running. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't able to run for three months, mm-hmm. um, which killed me because running mm-hmm. is actually the thing that I enjoy the most out of training for Ironman. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm back on course now and I'm ready to rock and roll in three weeks' time. Right on. And you're 33 right now? Hold I'm thir- 35 now. 35, 35. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting on now. The I'm gray hairs <laughs> are coming out. Um, and, and to date, what is your like best performance? Um, my, probably my best performance would have been Ironman Frankfurt two years ago. Um, so basically when I started doing Ironman, in 2014, mm-hmm. um, I went for a stage where I went an hour faster every race I did. Mm-hmm. And that sort of really took hold when I did Ironman Frankfurt. Um, it was a massive step up in my form. So I did like nine hours. Mm-hmm. Um, I ran nearly a sub three hour marathon off the back end of it. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, yeah, it, it was good and it was bad um, because the thing that kind of let me down was, was my right cycling a bit. Uh-huh. Um, because I just lacked that riding because I, di- I didn't start riding until I was 30. So yeah. I, I, that technical element of riding a bike and my cornering and braking and that sort of stuff, like it cost me a little bit. Well, I mean, 2014 was your first Ironman? Mm. Yeah. God, so you're still brand new to this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's, a, lear- it's a massive learning process that I've been going through mm-hmm. um, because it was frustrating as well. Because when, when I was doing my training and I was training on indoor like static bikes, the numbers that I was generating, like power output and my physiology... Like I know I was putting out the same sort of numbers like for FTP tests that what a lot of sort of like decent pro Ironman would be putting out, mm-hmm. but I didn't seem to be getting that translation across into road cycling yeah. um, because again, I, I just lacked the experience of, of riding a bike um, and, and that's, just, I've had to obviously work on it a lot over the last few years and, and I, I progressively have got better, but I used to be really, really bad. Like I used to be famous when we'd go on training camps, the Alps, I would descend on a bike quicker than I would climb up the other side of the mountain because I, I was just so frightened all the time holding the brakes. Uh-huh. So uh, that's amazing. Yeah, there's a difference between the power that you can generate in a lab and then translating that into a real-world 
context, right? Yeah. So that's like the learning curve for you. It's totally different. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, all of my training that I've ever done, for obvious reasons, has always been on static machines. Yeah. So, like, the rowing machine years ago whilst I was in prison. Mm-hmm. And then when I come out of prison, I carried on trying to, I tried to become a professional rower, but I took up that sport too late, and that's why I decided to do Ironman. Um, so, actually, power generating on a, on a on a static machine yeah you got was, that covered yeah, i was very very good like what kind I'm, of watts were you putting out um so like i could hold like three 365 watts when i was like 71 kilo for half hour yeah that's um, that's serious yeah for I, people that are listening that don't have a frame of reference that's like world class oh uh, yeah uh, it, obviously i was fortunate where the transition between rowing on an indoor rowing machine that power you tend to find a lot of rowers are very, very, very strong when they make the transition between rowing to cycling. Mm-hmm. Because obviously where it's a leg dominated sport. And also I just think you have the ability to be able to hurt yourself. Like I've never physically felt pain like I felt on an indoor rowing machine. In an Ironman or cycling, nothing comes close like to that mm-hmm. when you're on the rivet right. like, doing like a 2K flat out test because it's like the lactate builds up in every part of your body, your back, your legs, your arms when you're on the rowing machine. And yeah. I, and I, I think that, that like in thinking about your story, I mean, I think you have some genetic predisposition, like an ability to generate huge amounts of power, but your, your gift really is your ability to, to suffer over long periods of time. Yeah. 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 I, I would, I would say that. Born through pain and life experience as much as anything else. Yeah. But I, like years ago, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have seen it like that. Um, but obviously, some of the situations that I found myself in as a young man um, and some of the things that I did to myself, like when I was in prison when I was a young, when I was a young teenager and I segregated myself in, a, in an isolation cell for, for a whole year mm-hmm. and that was like defiance against the system. Um, the reason why I chose to do that was because I got moved to a prison and they tried to take all my clothes off me to put me in a special yellow boiler suit so the prison officers could identify that I was an escape risk. And, and I was brought up to absolutely despise and hate the system and mm-hmm. everything it stood for, government, politicians, banks. And then when I found myself in prison, the system become very real. And um, those prison officers that locked me up were real people and they took my freedom away from me. And, and when they tried to take my clothes off me, I refused. And they took me down to this isolation cell and they took my clothes off me and they gave me this yellow suit so the prison officers could identify that I was an escape risk in the prison. And then when the seven days was up, because that was what I was originally put in there for, seven days. Seven like, days of solitary. So it's solitary. They opened up the door and they said, you're going to go back onto main allocation and you're going to be a wing cleaner. And again, I, I, I hated these people. And, <laughs> and, and I said, there's no way I'm going to go and do that. That you're not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to clean up your rubbish every day. So he put me back in front of the governor. The governor said to me, you're refusing another lawful order. And I said, yes. He said, well, you're going back in that cell for seven more days. And he, he gave me seven days confined to cell again. And then when I was in that process and I was sitting in that cell, I read about Nelson Mandela. And when I went to prison when I was a young man, I made a decision that I would not become institutionalized. And when the librarian used to come around, uh, this uh, this lady from the library, she used to come around with a trolley and you take books off. And, and I used to think I will not become institutionalized and I will educate myself mm-hmm. to come out of here and be a better criminal, not, not to change, not to re- rehabilitate. Because I was brought up to believe that if you changed, you was weak and the system had broken you. So if you had rehabilitated and become a better person, you became a, soft. A, a criminal wouldn't see it like that. They would see the system had broken you. So I had that mantra in my head. And when I was reading this book um, about Nelson Mandela, and in the book, he said that when he was in prison, he used to smoke tobacco. And he realized that the prison officers used to use that as a punishment against him. He stopped smoking cigarettes. Mm-hmm. So then in my head, as, a, as at this point, I was 19. I thought, if you think by putting me in this isolation cell that you're punishing me, I will take it away from you. So when they come up the seven days to put me back up on the wing, I refused. And then I stayed in that room for 365 days. By choice. By choice. And they would come around Christmas. And I remember this. And, and that, I look back on it now, like there was a prison officer. I didn't see it at the time. I hated him. But I remember he opened up my cell Christmas and he said to me, he was just about to go off shift. And it was in the evening. It was about four o'clock. because obviously it was Christmas. People were going home earlier that day. And he said to me, do you want to phone up your mum? 
And I said, no. And I remember he opened up my cell door and he said, look, just, you can phone your mum up. It's Christmas day. And I refused. I said, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to use the phone. Because that would give them some tiny little bit of power. If they yeah. gave you something, they can take something away from you. Yeah. And I, and I think it was me trying to wrestle control of me taking control back of my body. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, and also again, it was that arrogance of not wanting to show them weakness that even though it was Christmas day, I wouldn't break and they, they wouldn't get anything out of me. And, and I would sit. And, and at that time, I thought I was getting something over on them. Well, in fact, I was only punishing myself and I was yeah. only hurting myself, but I didn't see it like that. I saw myself at war with them. And this mm. was about me being defiant and me not showing weakness and me not giving in to them. Well, I want to explore like how that ultimately ended up shifting. And I want to get into like how you got there in the first place. But before we do that, like walk me through the experience of being in solitary for such a long period of time, like how that shapes you, how you spend your time uh, trying to expand your mind, but also what you did physically. So obviously you got 24 hours a day to fill up. Um, You get into a habit of going to sleep very early. Um, I used to make two short choices as well when I was in there, read and I would not sleep in a day. I would not sleep my prison sentence off. So some prisoners would sleep all day in a segregation Mm -hmm. cell and I chose not to do that. So I got into a routine and when I was a child, I had no interest in sport or exercise whatsoever. You never played sports, were never an athlete. Play football. I used to get put in goal. I was the little overweight kid that couldn't kick a ball, but they'd stick me in guard. I'd always be the last kid to be picked and go, you can go and goal. Um, but I had no, I never idolized athletes as a kid. Um, I never really had any interest in sport bar soccer, football. Um, and, and that was about it. But when I was in prison, when I was obviously locked up, someone once said to me that when you go to prison, you don't live, you just exist. And I started off one day and I don't even know what the trigger was, but I started off doing press ups and I didn't know the names of the exercises I was doing. And then I would do um, press-ups, step-ups. I'd get my um, chair in my cell and put it up Mm -hmm. to the back of the wall and you could open up the tiny little vent windows just to get a bit of ventilation. And I'd start doing these step-ups and then then I'd do sit-ups and then I'd start putting all the exercises together and I'd do these circuits and I'd get up every morning at half five, six o'clock. And again, I was grossly unfit when I first went to prison. I was overweight. So Yeah, so when you began, like how many push-ups could you do? Not a lot. Yeah. Not a lot. Um, yeah. No, so I, you couldn't have been working out at, like at the yeah. beginning, like, okay, half an hour, I'm done. Yeah. I, I, I kind of just kept pushing myself. So when, when I've run, like if I did 10, the next time I'd want to do 11 until I get the pain and it hurt. And that would make me feel alive. And then and I would bolt the other exercises on, do 10, 10, 10. And then as the months progressed, obviously, I, again, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was obviously getting fitter. I, was, I lost weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'd end up doing a thousand of each exercise. And, it, and in total, it used to take me anywhere between like an hour to an hour and a half, depending on what sort of exercises, like with it, what I chose to do within it. Um, but it used to make me feel alive. And again, it was me taking control back from right. the prison officers back to myself. And that would last in the morning from six to so of half past seven. And then I'd have my breakfast and then I would read. And again, when I was in there, because of the sort of men that brought me up, I, I remember um, so of one of my stepfather that was, a, was in prison for long periods of time, 16 years. And I asked him, how did he stop himself from becoming institutionalized before I went to prison? And he used to listen to the radio every day and he would make sure that he read newspapers mm-hmm. to stay connected to the real world because he said, this is not my life. And that is, the, that is sort of, again, the mantra that I took on. I refused to accept where I was. And I used to think mm-hmm. to myself, this is not my life. So I want to stay connected to the real world outside of this wall. And I'd be, I'd, I'd be avidly reading about current affairs. And this is when I was quite young as well, like politics. Mm-hmm. Um, I would want to stay in touch with what was happening in the real world. Because this, where I was at the moment, these people would kidnap me. Mm-hmm. Again, they hadn't. I broke the law and I was in prison for it. Right. And your sentence... I mean, you had a, it was a life sentence, was it not? Well, that, when I first went, when I, was, when I was a teenager, that was, I got five years for possession of right. firearms. And then when I went back the second time, um, obviously because I had previous convictions and, and the judge expressed my links to the criminal underworld, 
it was so extensive at such a young age. He said, no matter what sentence he gave me that day, I was still going to come out of prison a young man because I was only 24. And he said that he believed that my risk to the public was so great that they would always need protection from me. So he sentenced me to two life sentences with a, with a, with a minimum tariff of five years. And what that meant is, because sometimes people get confused what a life sentence is. So as we speak today, I am technically serving my prison sentence in the community. So at any moment, the police suspected I was involved in any organised crime, or I was seen with any organised criminals, they could recall me straight back to prison mm. and I would go back on to my life sentence and then mm. I'd have to go back up in front of a parole board and demonstrate to them that I wasn't a risk to the public. And that was what it was about. It was about taking the burden of proof from the police having to prove I was committing a crime to them suspecting I was committing mm. a crime. And it was easier to recall me back to prison. So to this day, you could easily go back... Yeah. If you even tiptoed anywhere near any of this stuff. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. um, even when I want to go abroad to race, um, I did a, I did a talk last week, um, at Nike's European headquarters in Amsterdam and I have to ask for permission off my probation officer. Uh-huh. And then when I come back to the country, I have to go and report into it to prove that I've returned back to the United Kingdom. So that will always hang over me. Um, I don't, I don't look at it like, and be bitter and twisted about it. Like I got the sentence. I know why the judge gave it to me back then. Um, But my life's obviously moved on to such an extent now um, that, yeah, it would be nice if it wasn't hanging over me, but it is how it is. And and there's no point me stressing about it every day, waking up thinking I've got this sentence Mm -hmm. hanging over my head. I've got to try to just let go of that because I I don't want to become bitter and twisted and angry over it. Well, you could be back in right now. I mean, you could still be in there. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah, I mean, like, every day is a gift based upon, you know, that judge. hundred percent. And your actions. A hundred percent. And, and that is why I've got an appreciation of life and how precious life actually is. Because when you go to prison and, and again, like it's not a hard done by story. Like I put myself in there by poor decisions that I chose to make as a young man. But when you go to prison, it is as near to dying as what you could possibly get the, and being in the actual being alive still. Like, it's like you entomb your body into a concrete coffin. Um, and when you get those life sentences, like, yeah, you've, you've got a minimum tariff. But I can remember the day when my minimum tariff expired, I went to bed and woke up the next day and I'm still in prison. And then you realise how powerless you are mm-hmm. to actually, if the system doesn't want to let you out, you will stay in there for the rest of your life mm-hmm. if, if you don't play the game with them. So books, you read the Nelson Mandela mm-hmm. book. What were the other books that were impactful on you? Oh. Malcolm X. Like I can, you know, there's like a list of, there's like a bibliography of books that are most commonly read in, in prison. Yeah. I, I think when, when I was in there, like, I, would, I was very interested in history. Um, I've always had this fascination even since when I was a little kid. Um, I think that was one of the catalysts why I ended up doing what I'd done when I was a kid. Um, so my, my biological father passed away mm-hmm. before I was born. And my mum explained to me about he died and I was only young. I was like five, six years old when I was going to primary school. So, and because kids kept teasing me where my dad was. And my mum, she explained to me what death was. And I was too young to really understand what legacy was. But I developed this, this insatiable appetite for history. Like I can remember my mum used to get me these magazines every month called Discovery Booklets. Mm-hmm. And it'd be about Napoleon, Winston Churchill. And I can remember being a little boy and hundreds of years after these men were dead, people were still reading about them and they left the footprint on the earth. And, and that motivated me. Like I remember thinking, like, I don't just want to die. Like, I want to achieve something with my life. And that thread of that wanting to learn about the past always stayed with me. So when I was in prison, um, I kept reading about the past because I still wanted that legacy. I still wanted to achieve something in my life. Mm-hmm. And when I decided to make that connection about changing years later, like I said, the, when I read Lance Armstrong's autobiographies, that had a profound impact on me. That opened up my eyes to a possibility of like the characteristics that I had that were, that I was using like the will, the drive, the wanting to achieve something with life, wanting to be successful. The only people that I ever met in my life with those characteristics were all involved in organized crime. Then suddenly I was opened up to this man that did sport and they were massive attributes. They, and he was successful. And then I started reading all these other books of all these sort of Olympic athletes and endurance athletes. And again, 
they all had the same reoccurring blueprint of the same characteristics. Mm -hmm. But you're thinking at the time, like how you can channel those characteristics to become a master criminal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 (laughs) and, 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 And honestly, like Rich, I'm very fortunate that since I've been out of prison, um, I have a lot of friends and associates that have gone to the Olympics and they've medaled. They won gold medals at the Olympic Games, mm-hmm. the very pinnacle in rowing in what sport they've chosen to do. They've been highly successful. They work for like Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, big financial institutions. And when, I, when we train together, and there's a couple of them that we go for runs on the weekend, like long runs. And, and I've said to them before, you would be amazed the conversations that we're having about the world I'd be having exactly the same conversations with people that were in prison for being contract killers, for people involved in drug trafficking. You would be amazed the similarities in the mindsets of the two of them, but how from a young person, their lack of opportunity or the bad role models that have come into their lives that have warped what they've then chosen to do with those characteristics. And they've been exposed to criminality and they've thrown that into crime. And they was exposed to rowing or or sport Mm -hmm. um, and their fathers work for big corporate banks and, and they've chosen that path. And it, and it, and it even fascinates me sometimes like the, the the similarities in the conversations between two groups of people and the mindsets are exactly the same. That's profound and fascinating. The same mindset, the ability to focus uniquely on a specific goal and work your way towards that, whether it be criminal or athletic or professional. Yeah. I can see how those, traits would cross over and the differentiator is of course the environment yeah that's so, a, that's amazing some some oh, and again so give me a taste of like the, the that kind of conversation um amidst you know the criminal underworld um because i know it, what the it, i know what the athlete conversations are it, like. it, obviously in, in the criminal fraternity everything revolves around money um acquiring money mm-hmm. making lots of money um you tend to find with a lot of people that commit crime, what they've got that a lot of normal members of society haven't got is there's no real cutoff switch. Like there's nothing they're not really prepared to do. That they, I was brought up with a moral compass and you don't hurt women. You don't hurt children. You, you don't sell heroin. Um, you don't attack old people. You don't, you don't attack the working man. But the system and everything the system is, is fair game. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone that, I was round as a criminal who had that same belief system. Um, and so you tend to tend to find your whole conversations were based around making money, but making it through the system. And that would be through sort of committing robberies, um, people committing fraud, but all against, not against business, but against government. Right. There is a code, right? Oh yes. Totally. And the way that you see it, you know, my only frame of reference is what you see on television mm-hmm. and movies, you know, but if you watch, Goodfellas or the Sopranos and, you know, movies of that ilk, stories told of that ilk, like there's always that code, right? And that code cannot be transgressed. And in, when you're part of that universe, it all makes sense. Yeah. Like my, my, my stepdad used to say to me when I was a young boy, um, I was, must've been at 10, 11 years old. The only thing in that world that you've got is your name. And if people don't respect you because you've informed on your friends or informed on anyone and you, you sort of grasped, ratted people out and told the police anything, your name's finished. And the only thing you have ever got is that um, as a criminal, it goes before you. Like if people don't think you, what you call class in crime in this country is being any good, that, that's the end of you as doing what you're doing, being, being, being involved in criminal activity. Yeah. Um, but like, again, if, if I was ever disrespectful to a woman um, in any way, like, touched a woman, was disrespectful verbally to her, my stepdad would have gone absolutely mad. My mum would have gone absolutely mad, but my mm-hmm. stepdad would, would not tolerate it. Um, you always treat women with respect because your mum's a woman, your sister's a woman. Um, and, it, and, I, and I found that quite fascinating because as my life's progressed since I've been out of prison, there's been occasions where I've met women and their parents have found out about my past and they're kind of like, oh, you've got to be careful. But the irony of it is they'd probably be safer with me than they would with <laughs> someone else. And I've always yeah. found that quite ironic because the, yeah. way I, the way I see a woman... You can't blame them, though. You know <laughs> no, what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Like, yeah, armed robbery, no problem. You know, good on you. Pat on the back. But, uh, you know, 
sort of said a weird thing to a woman or touched her inappropriately yeah. and like not so good. Mm. So let's take it back to the beginning. So you, you never, you never really knew your, your biological father, no, my, but give me a sense of like the family that you grew up in, what the environment was like. So my, my actual biological father, he died um, when, whilst my mum was eight months pregnant with me. So he went to bed one night, he was 38 years old um, and had a massive heart attack. It was, there was no symptoms. There was nothing leading into it that led him to believe he had a bad heart. My mum said that he was a, he was an absolute workaholic. Like he wasn't a criminal. Um, he owned nightclubs, betting offices. He had um, shops, construction business, but all legitimately, he didn't, he didn't, right. he, my mum used to say to me, he used to Because that smells sort of like, it does know, the terrain of the mafia. It does. And, yeah. and all of, and to be fair, all of his brothers, like they were from a big Irish Catholic family. Um, a lot of them were involved in crime. But my dad, my mum used to say, my dad used to look at them and think they were all idiots because he could see the writing was on the wall with them. But what my dad did, because my mum told me that, because like, he owned stuff like nightclubs and then he owned betting offices, because he had these different sorts of businesses, he was staying up all night at the nightclub, making sure that people wasn't stealing money. And then he was waking up again at five, six o'clock in the morning and then going out in the construction business. And so he, he was surviving on very little sleep, a mm-hmm. um, lot of stress. And anyway, bad diet, dies at 38 years old. I get born into the world. Um, and I had a relatively sort of what I would class as a normal upbringing. Like I wasn't abused. Christmases come around, everything I ever wanted. My mum loved me. I had loads of aunties. Um, no real men come into our lives. My mum was single. Um, only uncles come into our home. Um, and it and it was just a normal child. Like I, I said earlier on, the only thing that really made it a bit different was when I started going to primary school, people used to tease me about not having a dad. And I asked my mum and my mum told me my dad died. And then my life completely changed when I was eight years old. And before my mum met my father, my mum grew up in a place in South London called Peckham. And she grew up on a council estate. And she grew up with a man called Billy Tobin. And they got, they grew, they grew up as kids. And when they were 16, they're both Catholics. Um, they get married. My mum falls pregnant with my sister when she's 18. Mm. They're just a normal young family in London. Billy goes out with his dad one night and he's working as a plasterer. And he sees his dad get murdered in a pub and three men stabbed his dad's death. When that happened, Billy's life then completely spiraled. And then I don't know, I couldn't tell you what was going through his head, but I could only imagine he then looked at life and he then went on a journey of becoming a normal guy, plasterer, young family to becoming one of the most prolific armed robbers in the United Kingdom. He had five acquittals at the Old Bailey. The police shot him two times on robberies. Um, he was a multimillionaire when he was 21. At eight years old, this man comes out of prison after serving 16 years. And he come into our home when I lived in Crystal Palace with my mum in South London. First time I will ever, I ever seen this man. And he was, I can remember it as clear as day. Like he come in, I was a young kid. I'm looking at him. He was immaculately dressed, massive gold watch. And he come in our home and he, um, he asked me to make him a cup of tea and I made him his cup of tea. And then as he was leaving our, our house, he gave me um, a 20 pound note. And it was the first time anyone had ever given me paper money. And I, I took this 20 pound note off him and he patted me on the head and he went, you're a good boy. And he left. And then I said to my mum, who is he? And my mum explained to me that it was her ex-husband. He didn't say like, hey, if you want a job, you know, come and see me. No, no, he, d- he didn't. I mean, it's very cinematic. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's like, I, it's like I can see it happening. He, just like in the movies. He, to be honest, he never, ever, ever, ever t- told. So he didn't come into my life, to my mum's life again, to be in a romantic relationship. But obviously because of my sister. Yeah, he's around. Yeah, he's around. He's around. He didn't live with my mum. He was living his own life. Mm-hmm. And when he used to take my sister out, he would take me out. He didn't have a son. I didn't have a dad. So you can already see what's starting right. to happen here. And he never, ever, ever mentioned to me anything he did. And he would take me to these restaurants and there'd be a lot, again, a young kid, a lot of older men, big watches, nice cars outside. People um, stopping by the table to say hello. All, all of that stuff, yeah. like going into restaurants, being in good tables, never having to queue. You could see when you went to clothes shops, the people in the clothes shops treated them differently. Everything was cash. Christmas would come around. And I remember like them all putting money together and giving you like a thousand pounds when I was a young boy. Um, 
always, always, always talking about money. Mm -hmm. Every conversation was about money and that was it. But no one really went into detail where the money was coming from. And again, you're a young boy, I couldn't connect the dots up. And it was only when my granddad died that me and my mum and my aunties went round to my granddad's flat to clear it out. And as I opened up this drawer, there was a massive envelope. And I opened up this envelope and it had all of these front page newspaper clippings from all like the national tabloid newspapers. And it was basically Billy on the front of them. And it was like how he sort of um, nobbled juries, which meant corrupt juries, paid them off to find not guilty. How the Met Police were after him for years and how he was the most influential bank robber in the country and that they organised crime and millions of pounds. And I was reading all these newspaper clippings and then I then connected up the dots where all of this sort of, this money. And you were how old at this point? I was 12 years <clears throat> old. Um, and it really... That didn't send me over the edge. That wasn't the, the catalyst for me deciding to do what I did. Um, that come a little bit further along, but it all started happening around the same sort of time. I asked Billy about this and he didn't really want to talk about it. He didn't ever, ever, ever really talk about when he was in prison. He, d he didn't like really doing it unless I really used to push him on it. But then when I was 12, um, big TV channel in this country, ITV, there was a, doc there was a film, sorry, not a documentary, a film, and this film was about my real brother, my real dad's brother. And he committed the biggest armed robbery in the world. And he sold 26 million pounds worth of gold bullion at Heathrow Airport. Wow. And when I would go out of Billy as a young kid, again, all the dots started connecting up. Everyone would go, is that Mickey's nephew? And I never used to really question it. And, and everyone used to always like, that was why they was giving me the money at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that was why they was always making sure that if I ever, if I wanted anything like, do you, do you want a drink? Do you want this? Do you want that? So did Mickey, Mickey got killed or he was in prison? He was in prison. So right. Mickey McAvoy. Yeah. And he, he got 20, 25 years for the, the armed robbery of stealing a gold bullion. Right. So a way of, of paying respect to Mickey was to slip you cash. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because within crime in, in the United Kingdom, obviously it was the biggest armed robbery in the world you're then dealing with men that hate the system. You've attacked the system on an unimaginable scale and stolen, which if you put it into today's money, would probably be a couple of hundred million pounds worth of gold bullion because this was like 19, 1983. Yeah. So if you put it into real world terms today, how much money that'd be worth. So within the criminal underworld in this country, it was it was the pinnacle of, of doing anything against the system. And then you've got this young kid that's then out with this very high profile armed robber that's then going into this world with other high profile organized criminals as a blood relative of that man. So then what that then started doing, when I watched that film, that film inspired me that night. And honestly, Rich, I, I genuinely feel embarrassed to say it, but it inspired me to become a criminal. Um, I didn't see the fact that my uncle was in prison for 25 years for that offence. I saw a Hollywood actor sitting on 26 million pounds worth of gold bullion. And that, to me, at that moment, was the pathway for how I could become rich mm -hmm. and how... I, my definition of success was how much money I'd make. And that was the pathway in which I was going to choose to do it. Mm. So then really at that sort of age, I then sort of had complete disinterest in school, complete disinterest. Like, and we're talking about when we're talking about like a criminal enterprise and we're talking about armed robbery, we're not talking about holding people up on the street. You're talking major bank robberies, like, like big heists and an organization, an organizational structure beneath this that's supporting this endeavor, right? Yeah. So how vast was the enterprise? Um, when, when, when I started getting involved in crime, when properly, when I, when I left school when I was 16, um, I, I, I sat my GCSEs because my mum pleaded with me to sit them, but I knew that <laughs> what, what, if yeah. I got an A in English or maths, it wasn't going to get me what I wanted in life, but I'd, I'd done my GCSEs. And, and I remember when I sat there and I... I got my grades at the end of the summer. My head of year was there and he gave them to me. And he went, if only you would have applied yourself what you could have done. And I still managed to salvage some decent grades considering I did none of the coursework leading in. And I got these qualifications. I ripped them up, chucked them in the bin at the end of my school drive. And I thought, I know what I'm going to go and do. Mm -hmm. My stepdad found out that I bought a firearm when I was 16. And in his head, he believed that I would be safe for committing crime with them than I would be people my own age. 
And as, as perverse as that <laughs> yeah. is, like it is, but yeah. it's, it's there's a, warp, a logic there. It's though. a warped sense yeah. of protecting you uh-huh. um, and trying to prevent me from killing myself or killing someone else. And meanwhile, your mom had to see the the signals, uh, right? So where is she in this? My mum, like when I was a young boy growing up, to the degree my mum would not even let me play with sort of toy guns like cowboys. She would not like. She did everything she could to to shield me to the degree she told Billy never ever ever take him and do anything with him. So when he would swing by and take you out to these restaurants. Was she, I mean, she must've said at some point, like, look, you got to stay away from this guy. She did. But the problem that you start getting is when you're a young teenager or a young man, you become harder and harder and harder for yeah. your mum to control what you're doing. Cause you always think your mum's wrong. I look back now, my mum, everything my mum said was right. Um, but it's very hard for a, 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 a woman to control a young man that's then around these such dominant strong alpha males Mm -hmm. that are enticing you in to that world. It's like a lot of those guys that, that I knew as growing up as kids, a lot of their kids went to private schools. They, they had the best education you could afford to buy. Basically they all went private schools. They went on lavish holidays around the world. They had nice things, tennis courts in the garden. Every single one of those kids left that private school and they become drug traffickers and they've all ended up in prison, Mm -hmm. but they had the best of everything. And that just shows you, what happens when you have that terrible role model? Like they've had the best of everything. They, yeah. they, they come out of school with top grades, top school and come out and end up selling drugs yeah. because their dad sold drugs and it, it wasn't discouraged. In fact, most of the time dad's got the sons on board and the sons got involved in their empire, in their drug empires or got involved in whatever criminality they were committing. My stepdad realized that I was following him in that line so like I said, he, he thought in a, in a full sense of protecting me, it'd be safer if I committed a crime with him than other people. So he then basically used to get me to go out and with video cameras and, and I would film vid, like lorries making deliveries to security depots in the suburbs and they would basically fill up the security depots um, and I'd give these CCTV tapes. So it's like recon. Yeah. You're scoping out a job. You yeah. got to figure out how the money's flowing so you know where the vulnerabilities it's are. It's like my, my, my role in it, become i used to be very good at memorizing number plates so like i look back on it now so i would go out in my in a car or a motorbike and obviously if you're you're delivering money to sort of banks in armored trucks that you so we call them security vans mm-hmm. in but armored trucks the same van used to make the same delivery on the same day every week, week on week on week. And uh-huh. you knew how many sort of, how many times he's walking in at the bank, how much he was taking in and out the bank. So you would know on a Thursday, they was delivering X amount of hundreds of thousands of pounds into each bank. These guys that work for these companies aren't looking at a 17, 16 year old kid. Mm-hmm. They're looking for middle-aged men, stocky, stubble, like your typical criminal, not some sort of spotty teenager that's a little bit overweight, chubby. Like they're not looking at me as a threat. So it's very easy for you to like get near them and, and count and look and observe and then pass relay that information back on. Uh-huh. I realized very quick that my goal was to be a millionaire. That, that was it, bottom line. And I set myself goals. I wanted to be worth a million pounds when I was 21 years old. And then as I got older, I wanted more and more money. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was these goals. And was your stepdad like, look, just we're going to bring you in. We're going to start you with small stuff, but be patient and you will be a millionaire. Like, was there a, it was it overt and explicit like that? Well, it was, it was, it was the, the, the only way I can explain what he was like. So he, he never used to stop telling me that he was a millionaire when he was 21. Right. So that was why that stuck in my head. Uh-huh. And he always used to say to me, do you think you'll beat me? And, and it was like a test. And even little things like when I was at school, he had a Porsche 911. And I was being a bit cheeky to my mum because I was truant in, didn't want to go to school. And I said, we live too far. I don't want to go. I don't get in the bus. And he said, take the car. And I'm 16 years old. And I said, what? He said, take the car. He said, if you're a big man, take the car, drive to, drive to school. So I said, all right. So I took his car and I drove the car to school. Now, most adults, you wouldn't let a child drive any car, but let alone a car like that. But it was, all, it was always, that was what he was like. He was always testing. Mm-hmm. He was always seeing how much bottle I had. And did, did I have that sort of capability to keep pushing it? And what started happening when he was, when I was out with him, and I remember this, and he was relaying these stories onto older men that at this time I knew that were involved in crime. They would lavish praise on you and they would show you respect. 
And, and that starts feeding into psychology as a young man, especially a young like a yeah. boy. And you're getting these like 40, 50 year old men saying, God, you got some bottle. Like I wouldn't have done that when I was a kid. And that starts feeding into it. And then you start, again, you've got no fear. I had no fear. Mm-hmm. I, di- I didn't fear the police. I didn't, I, I was brought up, it didn't mean anything to me. Authority, prison, police, n- none of that bothered me at all. I had literally zero fear. So if they said to me, go and drive 10 guns to the other side of the country, I would have put them in the car and drove there. Right. Because it was all, it, and they actually did, I was going to say that, that was a test, but they actually did do that. There was a couple of times where they did do that. And sometimes I look back on it now and I think, they're kind of exploiting me to a degree. And I didn't, I was too young to understand that. I thought I was in, I was in with them. And when I mean, actually it was about me taking these massive risks. Right. And, Cause and you're not, the one who's going to take the fall. Yeah. Right. And you're, you're, you're expendable. Hmm. Right. Yeah. The amazing thing is that we'd all like to think that if we found ourselves in your shoes, that we would make a different choice. And it's just not how it works. You know, it's like this slow drip of you, growing up in this certain environment and, you know, a billion <clears throat> small encounters and exchanges with people that leads you to that place where the obvious choice is to do exactly what you did. And that if I had grown up in that environment, that I would have made the same choices. Do you know what, Rich, what's that, that's aided me like so much what I've gone on to do with my life because I can have this conversation that we're having right now with a politician and, and I've had countless times I've met people in authority and they sit across the table from me and they go, I cannot see how you've gone to prison for what you've gone in there for. Even when I was in prison on parole hearings, I was sitting with my probation officers that have been in that system for years. And they're like looking at a file, looking at me, looking at a file, looking at me going, I cannot see how you come across the way you do and you've done this. And that, what that has done for me is I can express and show them what can happen to young people, mm-hmm. the most intelligent, articulate, driven, focused young men that there are up and down this country when negative people come into their lives and how that intelligence and drive and focus can, can be completely and utterly warped. And, and that's why we've got this huge problem in, in our country at the moment with yeah. young kids killing each other, getting involved in gangs like in America. Mm-hmm. They're not that ambitious and they're not, not driven. Like they're incredibly ambitious and driven but it's all channeled into the wrong thing because the wrong people have come into their lives and channeled that energy into something so destructive and they don't see the destructive nature of what they're really doing until it eventually leads to them being killed or spending their lives in prison. Yeah, a big part of what you do, probably the most important part, you know, everyone knows you as this triathlete, but, you know, with this incredible story, but it's your advocacy on behalf of prison reform, you know, that, that, that I think, you know, holds the most power to really shift culture. And if you just scroll through your Twitter feed, like you're constantly talking about what's not going right, what needs to be changed. There was just the thing the other day about somebody's trying to get um, incarcerated uh, individuals into sport mm-hmm. while they're incarcerated, but it was like dismissed or something like that. And you had a few, th- few words to share mm-hmm. about that. Yeah, yeah, like, so you talk, yeah, a tabloid newspaper sort of um, with political agendas that don't necessarily want things to change. Um, when I was in prison the second time, there were 85,000 men incarcerated. There was 28 of us out of that 85,000 that were deemed to a, such a high risk that we had to be put in a special high security prison unit in Belmarsh Prison called the HSU. We were completely and utterly segregated out of the whole prison system because we were either deemed to be a threat to national security or our escape was so highly likely. And if we did escape, we'd pose such a risk to the police that escape must be made impossible. And I was kept in that unit for two years with Islamic suicide bombers. Mm. The system wrote me off, said I'll never yeah, who were you? you were in there with like Hamza? So Sheikh, Sheikh Abu Hamza. Right. Um, the 21-7 suicide bombers that tried to blow themselves up on the underground system and the guys that tried to actually blow up the transatlantic flights going over to the States with the liquid bombs. So I'm in there with them. I'm told, basically, you're here because we believe you're going to escape and the likelihood of you changing, got two life sentences, is so slim, it will not happen. And I can remember someone from the Home Office, it was like the Ministry of Justice, come into the um, prison and I was trying to get off this unit to try to get into the main prison because I did actually want to try to escape or get out as yeah. fast as I could. And she said, 
we're not stupid. We know people like you will never, ever, ever change because, again, serious crime. And and if I've managed to do what I've done through sport, why can't the other 85,000 people do it? And And that's what makes me so passionate because I understand that once I had an awakening in prison and I wanted to do something else with my life and I discovered sport, what sport done for my life and sport allowed me to be successful. Um, it gave me, it's given me everything that I've got today. And it isn't even about being a good athlete. It's about what it's done for my life. It's about the people it's brought into my life. Incredible people, not just Olympic athletes, but it's allowed me to go in and speak to kids, thousands of them up and down the country. Um, I've met some of the most amazing, incredible people I've ever met in my life through sport. Now, it doesn't mean you have to come out, you have to break world records in prison, but it gives you access and exposure to positive people. And that is what sport done. And when I got released from prison, my social circle completely changed overnight. And, and I'm friends with nearly everyone that I was friends with when I first come out. Mm. And it broke me away from that, those negative people that were involved in crime. And I know sport can play such a huge role in helping so many different sorts of people, not just criminals, but people in life. It's such a powerful thing. And I'm such an advocate of it because I've experienced it in my own life. And as I said, like, you're, you're not going to meet anyone as it's from, from that extreme of crime than me. Like, I, I will I wholeheartedly say that I was one of the most entrenched criminals you'd ever meet in your life. I wasn't a horrible bully. I didn't bully normal people walking up and down the street. I wasn't that sort of like mafia Don boss, like went around and bullied people and tried to take money from restaurants and stuff. But I was driven by greed and it, every day. And sport has allowed me to give that up. And I would imagine one thing you come across um, regularly is this idea that the more you accomplish, the more you achieve, the more you become an outlier. So that somebody can say to you, yeah, John, like, look what you did, but you're, you're like, you're the, you're the unique example. Like, this is not going to be the case for all these other people. So like, why even try? I would say to you, I would say to anyone that says that, like, I have, I've gone and visited prisons and I've gone and visited young offenders and, and schools and, and I'm not the only person there. There are countless stories of other people that have used sport. Um, and it's played such a massive role in their lives and, and they've, they've, it's allowed them other opportunities to, to be better people. Um, again, I understand there's varying, there's varying levels of it. And I know I've probably taken it to the extreme because of the characteristics of which I've always possessed, the ambition to drive. Like, I was in prison. I mean, I realized I was good at sport. I wanted to be a millionaire. The next thing was I want to be a professional athlete. <laughs> but I've always had that. Like, I've always yeah. been ambitious and, and driven. And, and I know you, you can get varying levels of, of that. But it's about what sport can just give people to be better people and access. And as I said, again, it comes back to, like I said earlier, about having negative role models in people's lives. This can expose them to positive role models in people's lives. And, and I've also noticed that when, when I go into these prisons and I talk to inmates, you're far more likely to get someone to do something productive with their life if they're passionate about what they're doing. And I am yet to go into a prison uh, or young offenders and talk to an inmate one-on-one. -on -one. So you tend to find... I've got this sort of, I'm, I'm fortunate where when I go into a prison environment, prisoners don't see me as the system. They don't see me as the enemy. So they're quite open with their talking. So right. they'd be quite open about what they really think. And the amount of conversations I've had with inmates where they've, where they've gone, I said, like, what would you want to do if you got out of it? And it's been be a personal trainer, be a coach, work with children, give back. But do they ever say be a better criminal? But I don't want to be, but if they want it to turn out like they want to change, yeah. it's, it's about they, you're more likely to get them to stick at it if they're passionate about it. And most prisoners in prison are passionate about the gym. The gym is the most popular thing in prison other than food. So their food, then it will be gym. Mm -hmm. And the take up rate again, like we, we was, I was having this conversation with the Ministry of Justice, like within the prison system. So Ethnic minorities make up, I think, 25% of our prison population. They attend the gym more regularly than Caucasian men in the gym system, in right. the prison system in this country. So you can engage with some of the most disenfranchised people involved in gang activity straight away. You, you've got them in. You, they're susceptible then to change. And if you say, look, this, you, you're showing them positive role models and you're showing them ways that way they can get away from that life by becoming a personal trainer or doing something that they're passionate about, when they get released, they're far more likely to stick at it than if you basically give them a, 
a, a qualification that they've got no interest in, right. in doing that when they get out of prison. Yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, I'm not that familiar with UK's um, prison system, and I'm certainly no expert in the prison industrial complex in the United States. But, you know, at the core of this whole thing is not just, you know, punishment, but rehabilitation. And we've just lost any appreciation for how to properly rehabilitate people when they're in prison. There doesn't seem to be very much um, energy put into that. And what we do is we just create, you know, we're just perpetuating and increasing the, um, you know, the criminal underclass as a result. And in the United States, <clears throat> I don't know what the statistics are, but it's, it's far more um, ethnic and minority mm -hmm. Uh, than I would imagine it is here. And the prisons are privatized. So we have a built-in incentivization to incarcerate more and more people, keep them in there longer and longer and longer because money is being made. And there are you know, vested interests and lobbying groups that are trying to only you know, increase the scope of a system that is inherently broken. And, and what you're saying there is if you look at like the, the European model of incarceration, so the United Kingdom hands out more life sentences a year than the whole continent of Europe puts together. So that's staggering. Mm -hmm. our, our justice model is far more similar to yours in the States than it is Europe. And we've got, what, 12 miles of water between us and them, yeah. between us and like continental Europe. And again, privatization of prisons, um, incentivizing. So another example, I went into a prison recently so a prisoner was being paid, so he had no money. So he was in prison. He's got no cash outside, no real family. He's been paid to go to the workshops, five pound a session to make a file of facts. So he's, he's either got that choice or earning one pound 50 to go to English or maths. He's got no money. So what does he pick? He wants to buy tobacco and he wants to yeah. buy tins of tuna. So he goes and picks that. And he even said to me, what am I going to do when I get out of prison making file of faxes? And that is the problem, like you just said, if you incentivize that part of prison and you start putting in call centers and you pan them 50 pence a session, you give them like five, six sessions a day and they're earning like 20, 30 pounds per week, or they're going to do education and learn something and better their lives and they're only getting paid four pounds a week. It's quite simple where they're going to go and where that, that mm -hmm. flow is going to end up going. And then you get this huge problem like we've got at the moment where it's costing 15 billion pounds a year on people just coming out of prison and going straight back in again within a year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge, huge, yeah, huge recidivism. problem. So if you had your druthers, what is the reform that you would like to see that you think is actually achievable? I think there has to be, a, I think has to, I, I do genuinely believe that sport in prisons could be a far more powerful use tool than it is at the moment. Um, it, I, I as things stand, we're just, it's like a dog chasing its tail. Like there's a shortages of prison officers. That needs to increase because again, if you haven't got the prison officers, you can't let the prisoners out to engage and access the courses and, and, and stuff to help them sort of change. Um, but I believe sport could play a far more pivotal role in what it actually does at the moment. Like sport and exercise in prisons is used, but it's not used to the degree in which it could. I think if you used it in prisons, I think straight away, a prison officer would tell you this, violence would drop dramatically because you're, you're allowing young men to vent that anger and frustration through physical activity whilst they're in prison. Um, and again, I think you, you, then they're more susceptible to change. I think that they, 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 they wouldn't necessarily just keep getting up every morning and be driven by hatred towards the system. Mm -hmm. And again, lots of, in the gym setting, in prisons, that relationship's so different to the relationship it is between guards that work on the prison wings and, and prisoners. Um, a prison officer changed my life. If it wasn't for that Darren Davis, the, the prison officer at Loudon Grange, that didn't just notice my athletic ability, but he actually had an interest in, in, in me being successful with no agenda. Like he used to come in on his days off and sit with me as I would try to break some of the records on the round machine. And he'd bring me in books and he would talk about his family and I've developed a relationship with him and that's taboo. Like yeah, you're not in that world, that. That, yeah. that does not happen. And that just shows you like when you get people like the prison officers that if you have, if they're like Darren and they can reach out to people and, and they treat them like human beings and go, I want you to be successful. A lot of these young men, it's the first time someone's ever really wanted that for them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I would imagine a lot of the you know, these officers, they're just, they're just hardened, you know, yeah. they're used to being on the receiving end of, you know, a lot of difficult situations and they just become emotionally checked out. So, I mean, the, the, I mean, how unique was the scenario where this guy took an interest in you? He, he is a very special man, like without a shadow of a doubt, like yeah. he, the way, he, and that's, that wasn't just with me, that that's what he's continued to do with his job to today. Like he, the way he treats inmates, um, he treats them like humans. Mm -hmm. Um, he gives them a chance, like to the degree where there's been occasions where he's had altercations with other prisoners and the prisoners are stuck up for him over the other prisoners um, wow. when, they, when they've been out having arguments. I think someone like Darren and me together collectively, we can change mindset because I think you can go in and talk to these prison officers and say, you're not just paid here to open up a door and lock it up. You're here, like you are the front line to help these men change their lives and show them there's job satisfaction and mm -hmm. and you're actually are being appreciated that you're doing a, a massive task. Because also, of course, like you, when I've gone into prison, you talk to the prison officers. That you, I, I totally get it. if you if you're underpaid and you don't feel like the system and the government are really looking after you, you've got no dis, you've got this complete disinterest in your job, really. Like, mm -hmm. you, and if you've got no passion for it, and and you look at prisoners like scumbags, and you just think oh, I'm just going to lock them up, like I can't bother to deal with them. I'm not paid enough. You, you, again, the circle just keeps continuing yeah. and these guys get out and they foster more hatred towards the system and then they come out and then the, the offending gets progressively worse. Yeah. So you should, you should go, maybe you already do this, but when you go and you give talks, you should, you should go out together with him, right? Yeah. yeah we you guys we, do that. We've done, yeah, we've done some joint talks together, but it's something that definitely like I want to develop as, because obviously I've, I've got the balance act at the moment with what I'm doing for right in Ironman. Um, and then once that sort of that's put to bed, that will free me up a lot more to do a lot more things that I want to sort of do. Right, right, right. Well, let's let's bring it back to, you know, this sort of <laughs> the development of your criminal career. So you're scoping out the, the armored trucks. And when does it get like more serious to where you're actually committing these crimes and participating in them? So that was when I was like 17. Um, I then started getting more and more involved. And my stepdad gets arrested. Um, loads of his associates got arrested and he was the only one that w wasn't arrested. And I remember I, the morning of his arrest, I said to him, look, you need to go. And he was so arrogant. He was like, they'll never be able to touch me. And then later on that day, they did. They ended up arresting him with armed police. So I knew it was probably highly probable that the police were probably aware of me. And again, my arrogance was... They can't do nothing to me. There, there's not enough evidence. If there was enough evidence, they would already arrested me because they knew where I was and they didn't touch me. Mm -hmm. But what they did do, they, they set a surveillance operation up on me. Um, and when I was going to go and commit a, an offence one morning, they were waiting in ambush. And basically, <laughs> cars come from everywhere. Um, I had this car chase. I got away. Orig uh, originally, it was the furthest I'd ever run. Like I can remember I jumped over all these garden fences and I was being chased by police and I actually got away from them. And I felt like I was going to have an asthma attack because I was uh -huh. so unfit. And I was in this <laughs> telephone box. What was the crime you were trying to commit? So we was waiting for, a, well, we went there the night before to park up all the cars and we were going to commit a robbery on a um, cash and transit van that was making a delivery to the post office. Um, so what we did, we went there the night before to park the cars up in the vicinity uh -huh. and the police had watched us do this so they knew it was going to happen next morning and then they basically were waiting in ambush for us and then on the way there they decided to try to arrest us and that's where the car chase happened and as I said I got away from the actual car chase and I was jumping over all these garden fences and I got to a telephone box and I remember I used to always tuck 20 pounds in my sock to get a taxi home if anything ever went wrong and the next thing I know I heard a screech and I looked around and I saw this massive man running towards me with a gun pointing to me and I thought I was dead like I genuinely thought I'm, I'm dead and he they all he come running to the phone box and there was loads of others in my peripheral vision they dragged me on the floor and then he identified himself as a police officer and I thought oh thank god for that like I thought I was going to be killed and so that was your first arrest yes and did they get you were they trying to spin you or roll you to get some bigger names oh or? yeah 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 like yeah. Because you're but, the young, yeah, you're, you're the lowest on the totem pole, right? Yeah, but yeah, they, 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 were, it, they were trying to intimidate me. Um, but then when we got to the police station, like there was a very famous criminal lawyer in Britain um, and every most high profile criminal was using. So when I got to the, when I got to the police station, 
Like it's getting more and more like a movie. It was. He was. He was. He was like a family lawyer, and he, um, mm. yeah, and they. He, he basically he was on the phone. He said, "Don't don't tell them nothing. I'll um I'll send someone down." Mm-hmm. And then I was there for three days, and and then then they try to get really pally with you, and it's all like you're really sort of, oh, you, like your uncle and it, it, they, they try to like, you become, they try to become proudly with you, but even though they're not, they're trying to get snippet, they're trying to get you to lessen the mask because you, you let something slip out. Right. Um, yeah, and I was there for three days and it was just no comment, no comment, no mm-hmm. comment. And it was, you, you was well drilled on it. Mm-hmm. He was well drilled not to tell him anything. I didn't tell him my name and address. I didn't tell him my, like, my date of birth. I was being as awkward as I possibly could be. Mm-hmm. And they let you go. No, they didn't let me go. Oh, they didn't. No, that that was when. Um, so is that when you got the five years? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. And then, so you were like, you were just fresh out of the gate. Like your your career hadn't even really quite begun yet. No, but that yeah. that was the downside to mixing with such high profile criminals. Um, so I, I was mixing with criminals that had been doing what they've been doing for twenty twenty five years. Um, lots of them have never really been arrested, or they had like Billy had been out of prison at that point for like eleven years. Mm-hmm. Um, they wasn't sort of. Re- revolving doors of prisoners in and out, in and out, in and out. It's just that when they went in, they went in for huge periods of time and then come back out and just carried on doing what they did before mm-hmm. they went in there. And how often was it getting violent? Like how often were the guns getting discharged and very people rare. getting hurt? Very, very rare. Very rare. No, no one, no one ever got hurt. Um, in fact, like I was, again, my stepdad always used to say to me when I was young about you don't need to be violent towards people. It's all about verbalizing and talking. Um, so it was never like that you would watch a, a, a movie, a Hollywood film, and everyone's running around with machine guns, letting them off into the sky and stuff. It wasn't like that at all. It was very controlled, very verbalized, very taking control of a situation verbally, letting them know that you're using control. Um, and people get lost in that sometimes, again, because you see these you see these films and things get glamorized and you watch some people like I said, with machine guns shooting helicopters and stuff. And, right. and it actually isn't like that. Well, it wasn't to the degree with the people that I was with, mm-hmm. should I say. What else is the, are the differences between the reality versus what you see on TV or in the movies um, of this world? One, one, like the, it isn't sort of as violent, like as violent as what is portrayed to be. And you get these nutcases with, with guns putting them to people's heads. That that does not happen. Um, the drug abuse, that side of it, that happens quite prevalent, I would say. It's quite realistic because, mm-hmm. again, you don't realise this when you're in that world, but I think people are trying to always escape the reality of what's going to never, what's going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. And you're always living in that moment. Um it's like a form of escapism that you know eventually that it's going to run its course. Yeah, that dissonance of like fronting, like it's all going to be good, but knowing in your yeah. unconscious mind, like you know it's, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, it, and it's inevitable. Like you can't help but everyone that you, even if they're not close to you, you're always hearing about people having their doors kicked off and the police arresting them and someone getting arrested for this. So it's always in your subconscious that these things are going on but you kind of believe that it's never going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. But I do think when I look back now retrospectively, like a lot of the stuff around the drugs and the drink and the partying all stems back from that belief that you know eventually that you're going to end up going down that same road. Um, and were you, did you, were you part of that yeah, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh-huh. de- definitely. And, and again, like being a young man like, with, with my stepdad, like it was never discouraged. Like right. never, ever, ever like... I remember taking young friends out of mine like, that, that they were the same age as me. Um, and there wasn't that many of them, but I remember going out and him giving them drugs and, and, and offering it to me. Right. Like, and I was, I was 18. Yeah. It wasn't like, again, most fathers wouldn't do that with their children. Mm-hmm. But when you're in that life, th- that lifestyle, a lot of people that is flagrant disregard, like they just don't care. They don't mm-hmm. care about anyone really, mm-hmm. other than that really tight grouping of people. Mm-hmm. And where's all the cash go? Like, where do you keep, where do you, use, I mean, is it literally under the mattress or you have places where you're stashing it or you, are you laundering it? You would be, you'd be surprised by how a lot of people live when they do that. Um, they live like footballers and it's like a never ending well of money. So whenever they start getting to a degree where they're getting low, they just go and commit another robbery. Uh-huh. Um, and they're stealing like hundreds of thousands of pounds. Like they're not dealing with a couple of thousands or millions right. sometimes. 
Um, but they spend it as fast as it comes in because it's that high octane, never ending well of money that's going to, and, and, and how do you steer? Like you, you got to pay like on some, you got to pay some taxes though. Right. Or then you have problems yeah. that way. So well, yeah, you get, you get, you get, you get people that <laughs> you get people setting up a lot of you like start just buying a lot of stuff with, with cash. Then, you know, you get, you get, that's only going to last so long. Before yeah. You, you get a lot of people that, that buy a lot of restaurants uh-huh. and they buy a lot of industry where there's a lot just of cash park, park all there. It. And right, right, yeah. right. And it, 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 there's, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of ways people get around it. Like they've closed all the loopholes off the now, but like people would, for instance, give someone that owned a property, whatever the value of that property was, mm-hmm. and give it to him in cash. And that would go to a businessman that then had half a million pound in cash, but his house didn't really belong to him anymore. It belonged to this criminal. Mm-hmm. And if the criminal ever needed the money out of it, the guy would remortgage the house to get the money. Right. And there was ways around where how people would sort of circumvent, send the money abroad, send it, invest money. People would put money into drugs. A lot of robbery money would be invested in basically other elements of criminal activity. So it's just a never ending. Right. But it's a lot of work, right? It so is, it seems like, oh, easy, you, you, you pull off this robbery, you got all this money, but like, there's still a lot of, like that focus, like the, the level of like attention you have to pay to all of those things. If it was channeled in a different direction, right. you know, if they were at Goldman Sachs, mm-hmm. you know, they could probably have the same result. Yeah, t- you know. t- yeah. I, 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 <laughs> just just the other day, I was I was I was having this conversation with a friend of mine, and I was saying about like how when when you look at like a lot of people involved in like drug trafficking, uh-huh. and if you got like a a kilo of drugs in South America, and you manage to get that from there, and they're not just one kilo of drugs, talking tons across the Atlantic into Europe without ever sending an email, without ever making a phone call, and you've orchestrated that, and then the people are actively trying to show that you're linked to it, and you're keeping such a distance, and so many people in between you and that, that they can't link that back. The intellect to do that right. is incredible. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and even I used to get impressed yeah. with it sometimes. Like, I'm like, how on earth like that you get that from there to that level of of like money uh-huh. from one side of the world to the other and never even make a phone call or never right. directly be linked to it. And then you've got actively people like the DEA and the FBI, uh, serious and organized crime trying to link you to it and they can't. Uh-huh. Right. And they know you're involved in it, but they can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So, uh, fast forward to you getting busted and getting the five years. So, I, How's I, that go so, down? so yeah, I, I, originally I was charged with, um, nine counts of robbery. Uh-huh. Um, I was at the old Bailey. I was 18 years old. What's the old Bailey? So it's like the highest criminal court in the United uh-huh. Kingdom. So it's like the real sort of, yeah, you can't, you can't get You're better. It's shape. like the Supreme Court, yeah. I imagine in America. It's like the highest court in the land, criminal court. And I was category A because again, they believed I was such a high skate risk as a teenager. And that made it quite exceptional because I couldn't be kept with young offenders. So if you're under 21, you can't be kept with male adults. But because I was so high security, I had to be kept with them because they believed that because my uncle and my stepdad. So I go to court. I was looking at 16 years and I was 18. Mm. And like to me, a kid that was like, I can't even imagine. Like, I can't imagine I'm going to be in there for that long. And before my trial was about to commence, I was offered a plea bargain and it was for the five years. And my solicitor said, take it, take it. Because at that point I'd served a year and he went, you'll do another year and a half, two, and you're out. Mm-hmm. So I took it. The police were livid. They were all sitting in the dock at the old belly. I was in courtroom number one. Um, Judge Goddard sentenced me, a lady. And, and as I was walking down, the police were all sitting in the footwell. And I was so arrogant back then. And I looked at him and I said, it's a shit and a shave. I mean, I'll be out of here. And I was sp- smiling and laughing. And I remember as I was walking down the steps to take me back to the cells, the prison officers that took me to the court were all laughing. And they said, did you see the looks on their faces? And I said, yeah. And I, and I was buzzing off it. Like it didn't bother, again, that arrogance, it, yeah. it, it didn't bother me. Um, and then I went to back to the prison I was held in. And then that's when I got moved to the other prison where I ended up going into the um, to that segregation unit where the process of my training and exercising really begun. Right. So the fitness began with the first sentence. Yes. Yeah. And how long were you in before you started? Well, so you were in there for a while. You get the, you get the solitary, yep. you decide to stay there for a year. And then, this is where this all, this all begins. And then, then I, I, I got released. Uh huh. I come out. So you come out looking like a totally different person. Look like I completely, no, no one could even really recognize me. My mum, mm-hmm. I, I look completely different. I went in there like overweight, come out, like I had abs and 
I was very skinny. I was I went down to about eleven stone. Um and I remember some people said I looked ill and but I felt good and but you just I relapsed. Like, like I started going out very sporadically, go to the gym. Um again, the greed, it was all about money. Mm-hmm. I was determined then to make even more money than before I was locked up. And a year and a half later, um I get arrested for conspiracy to commit robbery. And like I said, it complete, the game completely changed the second time. Got the two life sentences, kept in a high security unit in Belmarsh. The minute I was in there, I knew I was going to be in there for a long time. I knew I wasn't going to, there was no get out of jail cards. There was no plea bargains. There was nothing on the table. Right. I was completely no, boxed no, off. And no smirking in the courtroom. No. No shit in a shave this no, time. No, there, there, there was absolutely nothing. Like I, I knew, like my solicitor on the first legal visit, I said, how bad is this? And he went, you're 50, 50, you're going to get a life sentence. And I said, really? And he said, yes. He said, like, it's one of the, one of the most shut and cut cases that I've, I've seen with evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, and we kind of just, then I just had to accept it. And so when I went back, I knew I couldn't escape because they made that impossible. So again, I, is how the, often do people escape? Uh, it does happen. It does happen. It's very rare, but it does happen uh-huh. maybe one or two a year. But normally it's people getting them out. So it'd be like people going to court and someone yeah. stopping the van on the way to court and breaking right, the ground. Right. Not it, in the complex itself. Not not so much. That's very it's quite rare. Yeah. That's quite rare. Like then from from high security prisons, I don't think anyone managed to break out in the last like twenty years. Yeah. So it's the very sort of bolt down tight how they've got it, and and they have because uh-huh. <laughs> believe me, like, yeah. when I was in there, like you would look and there is nowhere to go. <laughs> like there is no, and I, I can concede that point. Um, and yeah, and I, I kind of just had to get my mindset back into right. I'm here. I can't get out. I can't break out. My friends can't help me get out. How do I get out of it as fast as I can? And when you hear a life sentence or two life sentences, that doesn't mean what you think it means. There's still this, this potential opportunity that you're going to get a parole after mm. a number of years. So realistically, what did you think you were looking at? Um, I knew I wasn't going to get out of my minimum tariff straight away. But my mindset back then, Rich, was I didn't intend to serve that prison sentence. So in my mind, when he sentenced me, it meant nothing. So people say to me, when I got the sentence and he said life, you'd expect it to have an impact on you where you'd, you'd, you'd sh- sh- like shrivel down and mm-hmm. you think, oh, my God, my life's ended. I didn't. I listened to it and it meant nothing. I didn't respect the man that was giving it to me. I didn't respect the police. I didn't respect the Crown Prosecution, Crown, um, Crown Prosecution Service. So to me, in my mind, when I was got that sentence was, you can give me what you want, but there's no way I'm going to sit here and serve that whole sentence. And like I said, like, I had to think of other ways that I could get out. I knew I couldn't get out through running for the door, like literally breaking out. They made that impossible because of the level of security I was on. So it was like, how other, what other ways can I do to get out of it? And it was basically play the system, do what they want me to do. So mm-hmm. when they took me back to the prison, I said, what are re-offending behavior courses do you want me to do? And they said, we want you to do X, Y, and Z. And I said, okay. They transferred me out to the high security unit. They moved me to another maximum security prison. I turned up there and I did the courses. Mm-hmm. And then the next year, my sentence plan board, what do you want me to do? And it's basically like, we want you to do this, 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 and, and you do this, 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 and you're ticking all the boxes and they start downgrading you through the prison system. Is it like educational stuff or what is it exactly? It, it, it's, it's a mixture. So when you sit on your sentence plan board, you'll sit there and they'll say like, for the next year, we want you to get like um, enhanced thinking skills, we want you to do a victim awareness course and we want you to do your English and maths, uh-huh. like GCSEs. And then you do that. And the following year, they say, we want you to now do this course and we want you to do like your A-levels in English and maths. And you do that. And then what happens as you go through year on year on year, you basically tick all these boxes. And then when you go on your parole hearing, it says that you've done everything they've wanted you to do. Uh-huh. It becomes impossible for the parole board to say, we're not going to let you out. Uh-huh. As long as you've not been violent in prison, you've not been violent towards staff and other inmates, but again, I didn't even think that I would even, I had no interest in going to a parole board. Like my thing was, I just needed to get out of this maximum security prison. So, and it happened. It worked. After two uh-huh. years, they downgraded me to a category B prison. And I think I'm out. Like this, this is my release. Like, I'm nearly out now. Mm-hmm. So they transferred me to this open, like this category B prison. And I can't explain the difference in security is huge. Like I went from being on this tiny little wing in, in this maximum security prison in um, Yorkshire up north to uh, this prison where 
yeah, it, it was so open. There was not that many prison officers walking around. Um, it was very sort of relaxed. And I got there straight away. You know people that know people. And I said, anyone got a mobile phone? Mm -hmm. People have mobile phones and you're not allowed to have them, obviously. And I got a phone. I, I phoned up my friends that lived in the Netherlands, my best friend, Aaron. And I said to him, I've just got transferred here and stuff. And straight away, his first thing was, tell me when, when the first opportunity you get to go, we'll get you out. And, 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 and I know it sounds like a film, but this is how my mindset was yeah. back then. Like, um, my, when, when my uncle was in prison, when, when I was a kid, they tried to break him out of a helicopter. Like, so, so this was right. always in my psychology. Like right. I knew these things were possible. Possibility. Yeah. So when I'm in um, access to the phones, I'm in regular contact with my friends in, in Holland and Spain. Um, and it was all about first opportunity, wait. And I was like, okay, let me just see how things are going to shape up. And in 2009, um, my life changed forever when I found out my friend that I was on the phone to all the time, Aaron, had died committing a robbery in the Netherlands. And, and that was the catalyst for, for me being a different person. Mm -hmm. um, was there like an initial sense of, of like hopelessness or what was it exactly that shifted before you start to channel that into a positive direction? You know? I remember like that stuff people dying, people getting murdered, people getting stabbed, shot. Like, it never happened to me. That bad stuff happened to other people. And I would talk to my friends and someone would say, guess what happened to so blah, blah, or so-and-so. So I was just from a young person that I was always hearing about these things that were going on. That never happened to me. Me and my friends were good. Like You're immune, good. you're bulletproof. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't happen. Even I was in prison. You're smarter. Th that's, yeah, you, mm -hmm. you don't anticipate that one day that other person is going to be someone that you love and care for. So when that happened to him, I can remember when I was, I was in disbelief and I remember sitting in this prison cell and I was in complete disbelief. Like I couldn't actually compute that he was dead. And then the following evening um, on the news on channel three, because it was so rare that these English criminals were committing crime abroad in the Netherlands it made news at 10. It was our primetime news. And I remember sitting in this prison cell, watching my prison TV and my friend ran up to the CCTV camera and sprayed a can of CS spray into the lens and the camera froze literally before he sprayed it. And, and I know it was my friend. I could tell by his eyes, I could see it was him. And I remember sitting in that cell watching the last moments of his life and then the camera crew then cut away to the car because as they were getting away, the car tire blew out, the car flipped, mm -hmm. my mate got thrown out the car. And the car was just a crumpled mess on the side of this Dutch motorway. And I remember sitting in that cell and, and I, I looked at my life and, it, and, I, and I realized that precious life is like, that should have been me in that car. I should have been that person. I was the one that nearly got shot by the police two times. I was the one that had the mad car chases with the police. I was the one that drove guns up and down. My friend didn't. My friend got unlucky one night, never been in trouble with the police in his life. He committed a crime with a group of people and one night that cost him his life. And then I looked at my life in that place and everything that I was brought up to believe in about the system, um, money was everything. It wasn't. And I, I felt embarrassed. I, it was pathetic. Like I looked at my life in that prison cell and I had a 16,000 pound gold, gold Rolex watch on my wrist. In prison? In prison. No, because again, uh -huh. it, was, it was how arrogant I was. Because to me, that was a demonstration, an expression that even though you've put me in here, yeah, I've you. still got money mm -hmm. and you can't take that off me and you can't change me. And subconsciously, again, it was that expression of, 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 of power over the system. It wasn't about me saying to the working man, fuck you, like you've got no money or anything. It was about me demonstrating to the system that control. I've got these nice things and you can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. And again, it is, it was, it was control. And I looked how pathetic, pathetic it was. And all of these men that growing up as a kid that I looked up to and they were my heroes they were all old men sitting in prison or they were dead. And, and my friend just lost his life. And I knew from that moment that that was me done. I honestly, like, I can't express it into words. It was like someone switched on a light in my head and I had this awareness of how precious your life is as a human. Um, and the next morning I went down for breakfast in the communal eating area and there was all these guys and they were talking about when they got out, they was going to do this and that. And this person was an informer and he was a grass and he was going to do this and that. And I thought, I can't be around these people no more. I can't listen to this rubbish. 
And the only way I can explain it is like, if you was a drug addict and you wanted to get off drugs, but you was locked in a crack den around drug addicts and you're trying to get off. And I needed, to, I wasn't fortunate where I couldn't get up and walk out of that place. I was trapped physically. So again, I had to then develop a way of a form of escapism to take me out of that world like take me out, not just prison physically, but mentally. Mm -hmm. And that when training took on a far greater significance to me in exercise. Uh, so did you then resume that like <clears throat> diligent, uh, you know, protocol of the push-ups and the sit-ups and the step-ups and it, all of that? Or was there, was there the rowing machine there and you just said, okay, I'm going to try this or so like. What, what it was when, when you're in prison, you get limited to the amount of gym access right. that you can have. And I, and so your gym, your wing gets gym certain times a week. That's it. So you get free gym sessions a week on uh -huh. your wing. And it's to stop you from meeting people in different wings, case of fights and stuff. And when I went down to gym, there was this guy on the rowing machine and he was down at every session I was on and he wasn't on my wing. And I went up to him and I asked him, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm rowing this million meters for a children's hospice. And I said, what? And they let you row as much gym as you want. And he said, yes. So I went to the prison officer that works in the gym and I said, can I do what he's doing? And he said, if you go back up on the wing with sponsorship forms and the prisoners sponsor you, come back down, give it to us. You can row and raise money for, a children, for the children's charity. Right. So I went up, I went and did it, come back, gave him the shorts and he, he, he forms and he gave me a um, dispensation note. So it allowed me to get off the wing to go down the gym as much as I wanted. Uh -huh. So it was to row a million meters and you could row it 5K a day, 10K a day, 20K a day, however uh -huh. you wanted to row it. Got on the round machine, First session I'd done at 26 was 20 miles. So I rode 32,000 meters. And when I did it, I was in another world. And I mean that, like, people left me alone. Prisoners didn't talk to me. Prison officers didn't talk to me. And I remember looking at this little monitor in this prison gym, and I could have been anywhere in the world. And I just, honestly, it was like the only, it's the nearest I could say. It was like meditation. It was a form. It genuinely was like a form. It transcended me out of prison. I could have right. been anywhere in the world. And obviously I didn't understand about endorphins. I didn't understand about that. But that is obviously what was happening. I did it. The next day I went back down 32,000 meters. Next day 32,000 meters. And then I just, it become a compulsive right. to go down and keep doing the same distance. I did the first million meters, a thousand K in a month. And then I thought, I can keep doing this and this is going to help me get through my prison sentence. So I asked uh -huh. if I could do another million. Uh -huh. said, yes, did that. Did the third million, three months. Mm -hmm. Then a prisoner went to me, if you rode five million meters, that's equivalent from around from Britain to America. So it's equivalent to the Atlantic. Uh -huh. So I asked the prison officer, I said, look, can I just row the extra two million? Um, and it's cool thing to say that I've rode across the Atlantic, but really it was because it kept me in the gym for two more months. Yeah. As I was getting through the fourth million, um, I woke up an ability in my body that I never knew I even had. I'm in this little bubble in a prison. Um, you, you're not in the real world. You're in this cocoon. You don't know what fitness is. You don't, you, it's warped. I'd never been against athletes. I didn't know what was good, what was bad. I just knew in prison on this round machine, I could hold better numbers than Bob next to me. And a prison officer, Darren Davis, walked behind me one day and he looked over my shoulder and he went, wow. He went, that is is quick and he left and then a couple of days later he came back with all of these sheets of paper and they had all the world and british records on the indoor rowing machine uh -huh. and he gave them to me and honestly rich at that moment i remember looking at this list and i was like i can break some of them records now and i didn't think they were real i generally uh -huh. didn't and and i'd woken <laughs> up this this physical ability in my yeah. body i never i never knew i had uh -huh. I, I was good at endurance sport and i never realized it and it planted the seed and I went back to my cell and I come back and I said, can I do this? Can I try to break some of these records? He went to a man called Gareth Sands and Gareth Sands was the governor of this prison. He was a deeply religious man, like really, really religious. And Darren went, this guy, prisoner John, he, he, he wants to do something with his life. He wants to change. And I believe this could help him. Will you let him try to break these records from prison? Uh huh. And I don't want to interrupt you, but... Had you voiced your desire to transcend your criminal upbringing and change your life? Or were you just sort of quietly, you know, hitting the erg every day? Like has, was, had you told this guard, like, look, man, I, I really... Do you know what? You know, I, I, I never had. Yeah. I, never, I never had that conversation with him because, again, like... He could just see it in you. Yes. He sensed it. Yeah. He, he, he could sense a physical ability. And I, and I think he could sense that I was a good guy. I, was a, I, I wasn't horrible. Uh -huh. I, the way I treated people in prison... 
Um, even to the regard, like the other week, like I can't even remember this. A guy on Instagram commented on one of my photos and I'd read this, I read the message and I met this guy. He said he was in prison with me. I can't remember meeting him. And he, he was like, I remember the impact you had on my life when you was in prison and you was on the round machine, you was encouraging me. And he went, you made me feel so special and it helped me better my life. Wow. And I, I can't remember, but I, that's what I mean. Again, I, I wasn't a bully. I wasn't right. a horrible person. And I think Darren could see that in me mm -hmm. and he saw that I was good and he thought this guy could do something here. So he went around, the governor approved it. So Darren, a lot of the prison officers, they're not so sort of, they're not so open-minded and stuff. Uh -huh. And they're trying you know, to take you down a peg. A lot of them don't want to, a lot of them then didn't want to, I don't know if you could, it might be not want you to succeed, but Darren did. So Darren had to come in on his days off. So he wasn't being paid by the prison wow. to sit with me to, to basically validate the records. Right. And they, they had to set a camera up. They had to put a special chip card in the RAM machine to pull, pull the data off mm. and take photographs and film it. So the first record I broke was for the marathon and I broke it by seven minutes. Mm. And so marathon 26.2 miles. Yes. Right. On, on indoor rower. Right. British record. Brit British record. Right. Yeah. You broke it by seven minutes. Seven minutes. I broke uh -huh. the first one by. For in your first attempt. First attempt. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and even to the degree I can remember. So when when we okay. when when I did it, like I can't tell you my lack of knowledge on nutrition. Like uh -huh. sh glycogen, sugar, energy drink. I, I did. I didn't have access to it for a start, yeah. so I didn't have gels or any of that sort of stuff. Uh -huh. um, it was only my basic knowledge. So when I was doing the record, I I promise you. A prisoner had to go and get me a satchel of these like sugars, and I was putting raw sugar in my mouth and drinking water. Right, like what you would put in your coffee. Yes, or yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh -huh. having to put that in as energy, um, and obviously, like it, <laughs> I made me start feeling sick and stuff. But it just about got me through it. Uh -huh. And I remember when I broke that record, I was laying on the gym mat after, and I remember feeling this overwhelming sense of achievement, and. And everything I'd ever wanted as a young kid to be better than average, to achieve something in my life, to leave a legacy, I felt it, everything, I could do it through that, through sport. Mm -hmm. And I could use my, ve my body as a vehicle to get me out of that world. And not only that, but be successful. Mm -hmm. And this was the thing that I could do to find that success. Then from that moment, I become obsessed with being an athlete. Like to the degree where I'd go down to the library every Friday and I used to get the librarian. She had to order books in from the outside library into the library because obviously there wasn't that many prisoners interested in sports nutrition uh -huh. and training and stuff. So she would send, she'd get these orders and, and bring them in and I'd have a week. I'd read, 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 read. And I started to understand about physiology. I started to understand about sports nutrition. Then I started reading all these books, Lance Armstrong's book, all these Olympic rowers. What year is this? This was in 2009. Mm -hmm. And I started reading all these autobiographies of all these athletes. And I was like, I've got these characteristics. I know I can be successful. And then from that moment, my dream in prison was to be an athlete. That was it. Within 16 months, I'd set eight British records and three world records on the indoor rowing machine. And I was, at one point, I was the only lightweight man in the world to have all three ultra endurance world records at, at, simultaneously at one point. And, and that was it. I knew that I had this ability then. And, and Darren said it to me, when you've got the ability, not that you're fit, but you have the ability that you can suffer. And he went, if you come out of prison and you waste that gift, it will be the biggest travesty that I've ever seen as a prison officer. And those words to this day stick with me in my mind every single time I race in that Ironman on that marathon. I'm trying to imagine how this must have shook up the rowing community. I mean, did this make news when you were doing this? I'm just, I'm picturing like the guys at Oxford and Cambridge who are getting the print out. Like, wait, 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 what do you mean? Who's this guy? Like he's in prison. He broke these world records. Like what's going on here? Do you know what? You'll be very surprised. <laughs> yeah. It actually didn't. I, and uh -huh. the reason it didn't. So when the, when the records went on the system, they wasn't being put down that I was a prisoner. They were just putting my name and, and I was in Nottingham. Uh -huh. um, so th there was none of that sort of fanfare around it. Right. The only time, like, again, it seems very cinematic. I broke the world record for the most amount of distance rowed in 24 hours on an indoor rowing machine. And I rowed 265,000 meters in 24 hours. 
And I remember Darren said, start the record at four o'clock in the afternoon and then you'll finish at four o'clock the next day in the afternoon because in that way you'll be able to go to bed that night and you, your, your, your body clock's not going to be all out of sync. And I remember I went back on the wing the following morning and I broke that world record by 13 miles. And when I went on, it, even to today, I can remember it. They opened up the gates on this wing and I walked on and all of the prisoners were being kept aware of what I was doing. They kept saying to the prison officers, is he broken it? Is he nearly going to break it? And what happened when I was in prison, I become a bit of a champion because I was competing against people outside. And so the prisoners in prison wanted me to do it. Yeah, they wanted of course. Me to, they wanted me to of break course. those records. Yeah, yeah. And I remember walking on and these prisoners were on the landings and they was all clapping that I come on and I broke this record. Right. And I felt, I remember feeling, I felt shattered, but I felt amazing. I thought, wow, like I've just achieved something amazing. And, and I've had that sort of impact. All these people wanted me to do it. And it, it was an incredible feeling. And, and it's, it's only since, like, since I've been out, I've gone back to that prison and they've got like pictures of when I broke the records uh-huh. on the, in the gym. And, <laughs> and it's, it, it, uh-huh. it's, it's absolutely incredible. Like to know uh-huh. that you can plant those seeds in other people's heads to show them what you can do with your life. Uh-huh. And, but yeah, that, that was, it, it was amazing. But then it did start becoming really frustrating when I couldn't get out. Mm-hmm. Um, I broke all the records I could break. There was none left for me to do. Uh-huh. I realized I had this physical potential. I stuck. was young. I was strong. I was the fittest or fittest rowing fits I've ever been in my life. Um, but I was trapped in prison and I couldn't get out. I was doing these life sentences. And I remember I went for a real sort of stage where it becomes so frustrating to me. Like I knew I changed. I was demonstrating it. I broke all these records and, and people were saying how amazing it was. And, and, but they wouldn't let me out because mm-hmm. I still had, year, I had a year left to serve my prison sentence. Um, and that got delayed because they, they sort of made mistake, bureaucratic mistakes. And that led to me end up being in there three years um, over what I'd originally been sentenced to. So when did you eventually get out and how did that work? So my first parole hearing, we sat there and I had to get in front, released in front of a Crown Court judge. He had to come in. And, and what it, year is this? This was in the first parole, 2011. Uh-huh. And I remember, so you get your Crown Court judge retired. He sits in front of you and it, it's a typical parole hearing. Now you can imagine that you've got your judge in front of you, directly in front of you. You've got to his left, a lay person, member of the public. You've got a criminal psychologist. You've got your probation officer sitting next to you and your solicitor sitting next to you. And the judge went to me, what are you, what are your release plans? So I said, I'm going to be a professional athlete. And he'd sat, he sat back in his chair and he was smiling at me and he leant forward and he went, I have never heard a prisoner <laughs> sit in front of me and sat, but I, yeah. I Rich, I absolutely uh, believed it. And I know you might think I'm make, making this up, but- he, Oh, I believe, uh, no, I don't think you're making that just, up. I like, mean, you just broke three world <laughs> records. You didn't just break them, you crushed them. Yeah, it was- Without but, knowing anything really even about the sport and having never been in a boat. And, and having not grown up as an athlete, yeah. I believe you. He was like, and he's smart. And he went, I've never said, he went, I've never heard a prisoner ever come and say that in all the years I've sat life centers or parole hearings. So I had a criminal psychologist that does reports on you in prison. Mm-hmm. And he looked at him and he went, what we're seeing today, would you say this is all smoke and mirrors? And the, the Criminal psychologists in British prisons, they're notorious. That people often say uh, a swoop of a pen can keep you in prison for years. Mm-hmm. If, if they believe, so they have to diagnose if you've got an underlying psychological disorder, so sociopath, psychopath. If you are, you're a massive risk to the public. And obviously then you're probably never going to get out until you've gone through all these special courses that they want you to do. And I thought, oh my God. You seem to think you're please, delusional. Please. And, yeah. And actually the, the psychologist said to him, if he, he's gone well beyond what he would have had to have done to try to pull the wall over your eyes, he went like, he could have just done a couple of level three gym instructor courses and sat there and said the same thing. He went, but the stuff he's done, you could not blag. Like he was talking about the, right. the longest continuous row and those things. He went, you physically couldn't do it unless he, he deeply, deeply had a desire to do it. So the judge basically asked me to leave the room. I went back in and they didn't release me. They, <sighs> what they'd done... I get it. He went, I don't think your release plan's based in reality. He went, but I'm going to move you to a, a semi-open prison so we can uh, slowly integrate you back into society. Mm. So they moved me to an open prison 
where I was able to go out every day and work voluntarily in a, in a fitness first mm-hmm. gym. Um, so it's like halfway house. Yeah, almost, basically. Right? It's still, you're still in prison, but it all works on trust. So like, if, you, yeah. if you left and didn't want to go back, you didn't have to. But it did. It reintegrated me back in society. I got used to working. I never had a job in my life. Um, I started working as a personal trainer in this gym, in this little village up north. Um, and yeah, and I was there for a year and a bit. And then I ended up getting released in 2012 after the Olympics. I get released. I Google high performance rowing clubs in London. And this London rowing club comes up in, near Putney in Southwest London. And it was like a feeder system into the GB setup. Yeah. So I go down there and just to give people a bit of an understanding, physiologically, for my weight, for a lightweight man, I was putting out the same, so you get your 2K and your 5K. In rowing, those numbers mean everything. Mm-hmm. That That is it. So there's minimum requirements that you have to pull on a rowing machine to even be looked at to become an international rower. If you don't pull those numbers, you won't even be looked at. They won't even watch you row on the water. So my 2,000 meter time was 14 seconds faster what you would have needed to get into the international GB squad. Mm. So, and on, on my 5K, it was, I think it was like 38 seconds faster. So aerobically, I was much stronger over 5K. <laughs> but the problem that I had that I soon realized <laughs> yeah. was rowing is such a technical sport that in rowing, your class is a veteran at 26. Yeah, I took it up at 29, I was nearly 30. And I realized quite soon that I couldn't get to that level in rowing that I wanted to as an athlete. Right. So I had to make a tough decision after four months that this isn't going to work. This isn't going to facilitate me doing what I want to do. So I had to basically, I looked around and when I was in prison, I, I saw this episode of Transworld Sport and there was a show called Iron Man or a sport. Um, it was an Iron Man show within it. And I remember watching Kona and, and I just remember thinking, these men, are, it's, un, it's incredible. Like watching them get off bikes and running like two and a half hour marathons. And it inspired me when I was in prison. And then when I realized I couldn't become a professional athlete being a rower, I went on Google, Googled the criteria, and I thought, right, I'm going to go and do Ironman. Um, I went off on eBay and I bought a bike. As I said, I've never ridden a bike. I was 30 yeah. now. Um, I taught myself to swim off YouTube videos. Never swam. Never, ever, ever swam. Ever. Like, even when I was out of prison... You might have caught me in a sea bobbing around like when I was on holiday, but mm-hmm. no swimming, no nothing. Um, so I basically taught myself to swim. And the only race I could do was Ironman UK because I wasn't allowed to leave the United Kingdom. And Ironman UK was in six weeks' time after I decided that I went to do Ironman. So that was where I was going to do it. So I just thought, well, I'm going at the deep end. So I go into Ironman UK. I tried to enter the race, sold out. So I had to go and get a charity ballot place. Right. I ain't getting to Ironman UK six weeks later. So the furthest I'd ever swum was the day of the race. The furthest I'd ever cycled was the day of the race. But I'd run, like I'd run further than that before, like as, as, uh, longer than a marathon. You had run longer than a marathon. Yeah, like, so I, I probably, I should have probably mentioned this earlier on. So when I was in the open prison, um, I decided to run an ultra marathon because I was wanting to test my body. I wanted to, I wanted a different challenge. Mm-hmm. So the governor there, there was the, the gym instructors in the prison um, there was a couple of them were ex, um, like in the Royal Navy. And then when they retired from the Royal Navy, they come to work in the prison service. And obviously they knew I was this really fit guy. Um, come there, break, I broke all these records. So that my reputation sort of proceeded before I got to prison. So all these prison officers are like, this guy that's broke all these prisons. And obviously a bit of banter and stuff like that. And one of them started talking about ultra marathon running. And I was like, all right, what is it? And so anything over a marathon and stuff. So I said, oh, cool. And <laughs> when I was working out in the gym, I used to go to the library in the village before uh-huh. I would go to the gym to work every morning. So I'd have like a little half hour window to get the bus, half hour, I'd go to this library, go on there, ultramarathons. There was an ultramarathon from London to Brighton, which was like 56 miles long. And I went back to prison. I said, look, do you reckon they let me out to do it? So for, like for the weekend. So they go away. He says, yeah, the governor says you can do it. So the only running... I had ever done was on a treadmill in the prison gym. Uh-huh. Um, furthest I'd ever run was 10K on a treadmill. And the next thing you know, they've given me this note to start the London to Brighton Ultra Marathon. So they let me out. I go down to Blackheath where the London Marathon starts. And literally you run from there. It's a trail marathon down to the coast. And, and it was probably, as I said, because anyone never run, one of the <laughs> hardest things yeah. I think I'd ever done. Like, I remember my uh-huh. legs, my quads. After I finished... You I did finished it. it yeah, though. I did it. Yeah. I did it. Uh, 12 hours I did it in. Uh-huh. And then I remember like when I was running down the hills, I had to run backwards because my quads were yeah. completely gone. And then 
I paralysed myself afterwards. I got the taxi coming back and I remember the taxi driver who dropped me back from Brighton back to London and he didn't want to take the money. He went, I cannot believe you've run from London to Brighton. <laughs> and I walked back to the prison. All my legs were bruised up. where all the swelling come out. But yeah, it was amazing. It uh-huh. was amazing. Like one million percent. When I've finished with Ironman, I will 100% do an ultramarathon running. Like to me, it is... It is amazing. Like the, the, the oh, it, the way you feel is so much harder than Ironman. Mm. So 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 much harder than Ironman. Psychologically, I feel like it's more challenging. Um, physically, it's chan- it's harder. Um, but I enjoy, I love running. I love it. I find like when I run now, like I love. I don't like running with other people. I like running on my own. It's it's like a form of meditation. I I can really. I find it really hard to relax. Like I'm always thinking about stuff. Like when I go out riding my bike, I'm always thinking about things to swim. Mm-hmm. I'm always thinking, I can't switch off. But when I run, just switch off. Can't. And I could be anywhere in the world yeah. again. And it's as near, if not more, than when I used to sit on that round machine. From 10K being your longest run on a treadmill, not even running 10K like on roads or trails to running 56 miles on a <laughs> trail. It was amazing though. <laughs> and I'm still like picturing we've kind of put rowing in the rear view, but you kind of rolling up on this, you know, semi elite rowing club, having never been in a boat before and saying, Oh yeah, here, here's my, here, you can look at these numbers, you know, and they're faster than probably most of the guys in the club. Right. They, I mean, they, they must they, have yeah, been the, like, who is this guy? Well, like the, one of the first sessions I've done, so I, I, I got released from prison on a Friday, Saturday morning, I, I go down to the club, um, the head coach there was like, Australian. Who are you? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I emailed him before I come down. I said, I'm so he was aware I was going to turn up. They did not take novice rowers, but he said to me, what, what's your 2K time? So I told him and he went, all right, that, that is good. And he was like, and he, he had this philosophy and he said all the time, you can't coach what God's given you. And he, he used to say to me, if you've got a big engine, you can't, some people not, just haven't, and you can coach that big engine to row well. And that's all you need to do. That's my job. Mm-hmm. So you, I know you've got the raw power and it's my job to teach you how to use that power on a boat. But if you haven't got that power, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. how much you technically get good, the guy with a bigger engine will always beat you when he learns mm-hmm. to get that sort of the, the technical element. Um, but the problem is you just needed to get in a boat as a much younger person. Yes. I, I, it's I, the same with swimming. It's really hard to learn swimming, yeah. you know, older, when you're older, you know, in, in your later years, it's just something that you can pick up quite easily if you're in the right environment. As totally. a kid. But like trying to, you can learn to run, you can learn to ride a bike, but like swimming, it's, it's, it's a whole totally. different thing. You and know? you see it when you see people like come across from doing like cycling running backgrounds into Ironman, like they get to a point where they just don't progress. Mm-hmm. And the people that, like those low 50, sub 50 minute swimmers, you tend to find come from swimming backgrounds that have mm-hmm. swum their whole lives. And like to them, pumping at those sort of times isn't really a challenge. Mm-hmm. Where like the other guys are like trying to just get under the hour and stuff. Yeah, and they're expending a lot more energy. Because <laughs> yeah. the, the people who really know how to swim know how to make the water work for them. Mm-hmm. So they're so much more efficient and their output is, is de minimis compared to the guy who's, you know, <laughs> just slashing the water. Me. And like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how did that first Ironman go? I mean, six weeks, like, there's only so much you can do in six weeks. Yeah. Especially like, when you don't know how to swim. So, like, the, the guys, there was a couple of guys at the rowing club that, like, were there just recreationally, and we were chatting about it. And, like, one of them said to me, um, he said, look, there's no point you going out doing massive bike rides now because you've never ridden a bike. You'll probably get injured. So you might as well just ride the distance in the race. Um, <laughs> so it was, it, it was, it was, like, when I race, I put, like, I've, I, I see this as an athlete. So I've nearly been killed two times, right? Literally been to the point where I'm fractions of inches away from a policeman shooting me dead. In the bigger picture of things in life, like I've nearly lost my life. So I look at everything like that through that lens. So there's a really doing a race, doing a swim and I, man, it's, it's not really that big of a deal while getting on a bike, riding a bike. Like it's just physical activity, sack exercises. There's no real great significance other than that. Like I'm not going to lose my life doing it. Mm-hmm. And I just put everything into relative terms of like, when I've had my life taken off me for 10 years, that's in that, that, that's stress. That's a lot of stress to go through. Like when, when you're an Ironman, I see that as it's a privilege. I'm there that morning. I'm physically able to do it. One day I won't be able to like, and it, I, I see it as a massive honor and privilege to be there and be able to physically do it and compete it. Um, 
And I did that morning, I turned up, I didn't have any fear whatsoever. And I thought, just experience it and see what it's like. And do you know what? The only thing that I really got from it, like, one, it was amazing when I finished it, like to watch that TV show on prison and then be there and actually do it and run down that red carpet was, was, was incredible. But it was when I was on the bike, one of the pro guys went past me. And even though I'd never obviously ridden that dike, he lapped me because mm-hmm. it was like three loops of mm-hmm. the same circuit. And I thought that will never happen to me again in an Ironman race. I remember that. And, and that, they, those were the things that really stuck with me. And I finished the race and, and I thought, right, I didn't, honestly, Rich, I didn't feel that touched by it. I didn't feel, I, I felt comfortable. I felt I was within myself. Like I didn't, I didn't feel like I was going to blow up. I wasn't massively quick. Like Ironman UK is quite hilly and I did it in like 11 and a half hours. Mm-hmm. So I finished, I think, 100 out of like three and a half thousand people. Um, but I just thought, like, 11 and a half in six weeks without knowing how to swim and having never ridden yeah. a bike. <laughs> I was very rowing fit though. Yeah. I was very rowing yeah, fit. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But it was, um, but yeah, and then I thought, right, well, this is, this is what I'm going to do. This is it. And, mm. and then I, I started, um, I made a lot of, I made a lot of errors then, um, because then I, I thought it was too easy. And I thought I would train how I trained on a ram machine in prison, the same Iron Man. So I went from basically never really being a runner to running nearly a marathon every Saturday, Sunday morning around Battersea Park. Within eight weeks, I could comfortably run sub three hour marathons. It wasn't hard. It, it was like, I remember, and what happened, it became very addictive because I was talking to guys and they were like, they're talking about like running a sub three at London. I was thinking, that's not hard. Like I can do that in training. I do it all the time. I do it every Saturday. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I got quicker and quicker and quicker. And, they, and, they, and the same from bike. I was riding indoor bikes, squat bikes in the, in, the, in the rowing club. My watts just got bigger and bigger and bigger because I, I kept training as hard as I could every session because the suffering. And you're just, you're freewheeling it though. Like you're not working no, with a coach. No program, no nothing. And again, that was something, this is something that st- st- stuck with me from being a kid of distrust. Like I thought to myself then, this is my goal. Mm-hmm. This is my dream, not someone else's. And I don't trust anyone else with this. And and I thought I knew better. I thought that like, I could do this myself. And and as I said, I dug myself into the biggest hole. Like yeah. I was sweating. I was waking up in the early hours of the morning, sweating. I was getting up early. And then to me, then it become how much do I like, even though I feel like crap, I'm just gonna go out and just keep hammering it. And mm-hmm. I'm gonna hammer it. And and again, I just kept digging this hole and I was getting quicker, but my body wasn't recovering. It was breaking down, it was breaking down. And then I ended up really getting sick. I started, um, I went on a training camp and I remember went for a swim one morning and I, I couldn't breathe. And I thought, what? Like, I've never felt anything. I, I could not breathe, physically breathe. And I got out of the water and then later on that day, I was in the car, couldn't breathe again. And obviously I was having like a panic attack where I was draining the life out of my body. Got a virus, then went back to Ironman yet, okay, the, 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 the following year mm-hmm. and just absolutely fell apart. Mm-hmm. It was the most humiliated I'd ever felt in my life. I felt worse that day than I ever did being in any of those courts, getting that life sentence. Like I felt ashamed. Um, I had all my friends, like, like, t- like Terry come up, my really close friend, and Darren, the prison officer, come up. And I remember like them being on the side of the course. And I felt like I let everyone down. They put a lot of time. And, and I come away from that race, and I realised I didn't have the skills to, to, to coach myself. Or the humility. Yeah. You know, the humility is the big lesson there. Going from this stubborn guy who thinks he knows best, <clears throat> you can't be a great athlete without the humility to be able to take direction from mm. people who, who want to help you. Mm, totally. Yeah. And, I, and I had to realize that, but I had to realize it in that moment. That had to happen to me. That had to happen. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, you, yeah. You're, you were unteachable. Yeah. Right? Totally. So your most impressive world record is perhaps uh, uh, a world record from going from complete novice to overtrained in the shortest period of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I went from like, yeah, I went from like li- literally zero hours for Ironman training to like 35, 40 hours a week of just, yeah, just as hard as I could do it. Right. That was all The body can't absorb that much nope. that quickly. But I thought it could. Yeah. And, I, and again, I thought it could because I was thinking I rode two hours a day every day in prison on a rowing machine. I remember like some of those sessions when I was in prison, um, on those rowing machines and, and I got to like a couple million meters and it was, it was every day. Like there was uh-huh. no rest days and my hand, ten, it was like the tendons of my hand become like a claw and I, you could unclick my fingers. So I, I knew I had that propensity to push myself that hard. Right. And, and to me, that suffering of getting up in the morning and feeling like crap because I was overtraining 
was to me an expression of how much I wanted this goal because mm-hmm. it was like I can suffer more than other people and that really become my Achilles tendon but it was the best thing that happened to me falling apart that day yeah better then than now yeah right so it must have taken you a while to climb out of that hole yeah like I had to go to hospital and I had ECGs uh, done to make sure I didn't mess my heart up um I just had a re- I had post-viral fatigue um I was very fortunate that my body did kind of over in a couple of months like I didn't stop training completely, but I completely backed off. Like I still, the longest I've not exercised for in since mm-hmm. 26 years old or 20, 25 was probably last year. And I had 12 days off completely. I'd done literally no exercise. And that was, it's such an ingrained part of me. Like I couldn't ever imagine not being physically active mm-hmm. of just doing something. Even that means me getting up and going for like a 10 K run or something like that. Like I, that, that was, but I've learned that's what I mean. I've learned mm-hmm. about my body. I've learned I need to do that. I can't, especially as I get a bit older, I can't keep sort of like going to the well all the time and pulling the bucket down and, and I'm trying to just absorb loads and loads and loads of loads. I have to be a bit more intelligent with stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite the arc. Uh, like if you go to your website, like right there on the homepage, it's like you have all the people that, you know, comprise your team that are helping you. So from that guy who's so stubborn, who thinks he knows everything and won't let anybody tell him anything to having, you know, what I saw when I looked at your website, I was like, oh, that's, that's humility. Mm -hmm. Like he understands that this is a team effort and that you can't do what you do alone. We have Terry here who, Mm -hmm. I mean, is this around the time where Terry, you know, comes into your life? No, Terry came into my life. Well, Terry came into my life when I was working in the gym. So Mm -hmm. when I was working part time, Uh Terry was a member and a, um, a gym instructor that was helped like work with Terry sometimes doing massage with him come up to me one day he said see that guy up there he's like a sports psychologist and all I heard was sport so he went I introduced you so Terry yeah. Terry was on um, like a treadmill and I'd gone up and I've just introduced myself and I think Terry thought who is this guy and then obviously we sat down and I told Terry my backstory and, guy with the crazy eyes yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he thought who, who, is it, who is this man and stuff and, and we just struck up this friendship and Terry was like he just, he paid an interest in me and that, that he wanted to help me. And again, there was no agenda. And then when I used to get out on a Sunday, I was so far from London because I was, I was up in a, near just outside Derby, which is about 200 miles away. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't commute to London and go back up with my, you get like something they call a town visit. You'd be out of prison for 12 hours. And Terry, me and Terry used to go out for dinner or lunch in, um, in the local town. He would take me out for a Sunday dinner and we'd sit there and we'd talk about stuff and, and then he was really just part of my journey ever, ever since. And Terry was one of the first people I'd say that I really, really did trust. Like I really opened up and, and everything I've gone into do in my life, like without him being part of it, it wouldn't be where it is today. Um, he's, mm-hmm. he's been, he's been a massive part, a role of what I do. Um, mm-hmm. And again, you, it doesn't matter how driven and focused you are. You need good people around you to help you reach mm-hmm. your potential in life. And it works both ways. Like I'm sure Terry's learned things from the experiences that we've been through and, and vice versa. I um, mean, it's been amazing to share it with someone else as well. Right, 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 right. And then you bring on somebody who's triathlon specific. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's been, um, yeah, the physical element of it. Like, so we did some training sessions before that Ironman and I fell apart and he knew how fit I was because he saw through some of the training stuff that we were doing together. Uh-huh. And then when we did Ironman UK, he finished fourth, fifth overall. Uh-huh. And, and I finished like a hundredth. And he went, like, like he, he ran past me when I was walking on the yeah. marathon. And yeah, he, you had your way. Yeah. Now we know what happens when you do <laughs> yeah. it your way. And he Time reached, to do it my way. He reached out to me and he said, look, I'll coach you for free. I just want to help you just be the best athlete you can be. And mm-hmm. I've been working with him for the last sort of three, three and a bit years. Mm-hmm. So then when was your big breakthrough race? Probably Frankfurt. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that, that was quite a step up. Like, and you went nine or sub nine? Nine, nine, nine. You went um, nine even. Yeah, like, again, it, I'm always learning. Um, the bike has really been the thing I've been learning the most. Like the running, for instance, like my Ironman marathon's like three hours. So I can get off and run a three-hour marathon. Uh-huh. Fairly comfortable. Like, it, it's not really a push. Um, but the bike's been the thing where it's not been the power, it's been... The, just the the lack of riding years and that the like taking corners too wide, breaking too much, and that starts adding up a lot over 180k. And then sometimes I've looked at races where guys that make my weight um, are putting out similar numbers that I'm putting out, and they're like 15 minutes up the road from me. Mm-hmm. And you know you can't give that sort of time away. To yeah, people. you're not. You're you have to learn how to translate that engine that you yeah. have into 
speed. And it's right. and, it, and it is coming. Hopefully, mm-hmm. it comes in three yeah. weeks time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you live in London proper? Yeah, you do. So, yeah. where do you go to train and do your long rides? And so, everything? I go out to like Windsor. Um, so after you leave, when you leave mine, you've got like a 20 minute, a bit of faff with traffic and stuff. And then uh-huh. it's kind of just flat, fast roads going out to Windsor Castle. Or you've got the Surrey Hills. Again, it's another 15, 20 minutes getting mm. out. And then you get clear roads around, like all around the Surrey Hills and stuff, which is quite nice. Running Richmond Park down the towpath. I like, mm-hmm. that's one of my favorite runs all the way down the towpath. Like you could run from, you can run from basically Putney, Southwest London, all the way up to Thames. This mm-hmm. is actually an ultra marathon, and the Thames 100. Mm-hmm. It's just up the side of the soap off. <laughs> right. Right. Cool. And, uh, and the swimming, you do, there, there is a pool where you get out in open yeah. water. Or yeah. You got Hyde Park. Yeah. So you got the Serpentine. Right. Um, or yeah, or most of the other time I just swim in Lidos. So uh-huh. there's quite a few of them dotted around London. And do you train alone? What's yes. the community like here? Um, Quite good, Southwest London. You, you tend to find a lot of guys at Kona. The Brownleys live in town here. No, they they live up in Leeds. They do. So they're Northerners, uh-huh. but like a lot and of Tim Don's in Boulder. Yeah, Tim. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> but a lot of the um, I think he's from Twickenham originally. He's just he? where he grew up. Yeah, he grew up know. in Twickenham. So that's not uh-huh. that's not too far away from Richmond. It's about right. fifteen minutes away. But a lot of really good Ironman triathletes actually live around Southwest London. Uh-huh. So a lot of guys that are very very good age groupers like are, are based that way. So you, you do get some decent guys going out, but I do train on my own a lot. Yeah, you strike me as that. Yeah. You're a lone wolf. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I, I, I go out. Yeah. I do go out riding sometimes with people, and then mm-hmm. I think, why have I done this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's different if you go out. Like I go out sometimes. It's, it's hard sometimes because I go out with guys that row, and now are very very fit. But then they want to push the pace too much, and it's too too too. Yeah, hard. the discipline is you gotta you gotta do what what. You got to fulfill the intention for that workout. Yes. And when you're training for Ironman or ultra endurance, a lot of that discipline plays into holding back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause everyone it's, you know, there's a dick measure in context. Yeah, totally. Like, <laughs> totally. I didn't <laughs> yeah, want to put it like, like that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every, we always just say it's like willy waving. Everyone was just, just <laughs> yeah. like, see how quick they can go up a climb right. and then they all blow up and then you're, you're all sort of, they're limping back coming. Like the other week I went riding with a friend of mine out to Henley. It's like a hundred mile ride. And I said, are you, are you sure you want to come? He went, yeah, yeah, I'll sit on your wheel. So I said, okay. So we were averaging like 35k an hour and he's on the back wheel. And then we got to this like open stretch of road and he's, he's come out behind me, right, about 60 k to ride, tore off. Mm-hmm. Right? And I thought, what I do, I'll just keep him that 10 meter gap, just do a bit of practicing. So I'm not drafting him. So a bit of Ironman work. And he's looking behind and he thinks he's dropped me. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, oh, go on, I'll let you go. And he's looking behind it. And he, I can tell he thinks I've dropped him. So I thought, right, I'm just going to have to let him see now. So I've come up into his wheel, closed the gap, and then just tore around him and gone. Yeah. And he's like, wow. Like, he can't but you it. weren't supposed to, that wasn't part of what you were supposed to be doing that but what day. That but you can't him, help it. What, I just, what yeah. happened to him, when we were coming back, he was quite tanned. Limping. And I looked at him and he started going like, do you know you see someone going ash white? And I said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh-huh. And then he went, no, I'm not. He went, I really feel bad. Can we stop and get a Mars bar? And we, just, mm-hmm. we had to pull over to the side of the shop. And he, he got, and that, so that's probably a lot, a lot of the reasons why I don't like training with other people. Well, here you are today and you have fulfilled this promise, this aspiration that you articulated to the parole board of being a professional athlete. I mean, you are a professional athlete. You're a Nike sponsored athlete. You're the only triathlete, triathlete that Nike sponsors, Ironman. right? Ironman, Ironman triathlete. Yeah. Wow, man. How did that come together? Um, how can I put this, Rich? It was like, it was, it was like a fairy tale. It was like, honestly, it, it like, pfft. It was one of the biggest things in my life, my, on it, like as an achievement. Like a, a man that was in prison at like twenty six that said, "I want to be a professional athlete." Um, people laughed at. People said, "You never had to do it. You took up sport too late. You'll never do it when you get out of prison. You're a prisoner. You'll you're reoffend." It was hard when you get out. Like you'll never be able to do that. Like you're just slipping to old crowds and you'll start mm-hmm. getting involved in robberies and doubted me. And then, but out of prison, overtrained, got sick. Made decisions to get a coach, carried on at it, believing every day. I honestly, there's one thing I I visualized and believed every day everything I was doing would pay off. I, I knew it. I knew it. I, I didn't know what it would be. And I just Where I does that knowingness come from? Self belief. I, I always believed whatever I put my mind out. Like I, I believed when I was a kid that I'd be a multi millionaire. I believed I on it I j I've just always had it in me, this intrinsic thing that's this overwhelming need to want to do something great with my life um, from being a young kid. 
And that's that belief that I could do it. I've never lacked belief. Like my mum said this to me recently. She said, even when I was little, she would take me to like summer camp and all of these kids would be in a corner and they'd all be like looking around and never knew what to do. And I'll just go off on my own and do it. So like if it was rock climbing, everyone's like, oh, it's great for thing. I'd put the thing on and I'd climb the wall. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I didn't put the safety on so they'd go mad at me. But I've always had that in me. Like I would always be very assertive and I'd like, bang, I'm going to do it and do it from being a young boy. And, and I had that belief. And I remember I was out of prison for two years. I overtrained and I was around my mum's one day. And, and I remember like, I was talking to my mum about it and I said like, I can't, I cannot and will not give up on this. And I, I had the CCG box on my heart from the hospital. They went to Moyton for 24 mm-hmm. hours. And I went, I know mum, it will pay off. And my mum said, just carry on doing what you're doing and follow your dream. Do not stop. And, and I didn't. And I went up and I raced again the following year and I had a much better result. And then last, the Christmas before last, Terry, that has obviously been a massive part of my life, um, he, he acts as a bit of a firewall. He runs my website. And every day we ring each other up in the morning and he says, these are the emails that have come through last night or yesterday. And we talk about maybe a school wants me to go in and do a talk, a prison, whatever it is, it'd be something. And he said, now I'm about to tell you something, it's going to change the rest of your life. So I said, what? And he went to me, guess who sent us an email last night? And I went, who? He went, guess. And I went, who? And he went, it's a massive brand. And, I, and again, like, you, it, it wouldn't even compute. And I said, who? And he said, Nike. And I was like, no, I don't believe you. He went, I'm going to send you the email. And he forwarded the email one. And it was um, a guy called Dan Smith that worked in London, head of track and field. And he basically said that, they become aware of my story and they, they felt inspired. And at the time I had like a relationship where I was an ambassador for a clothing range. It was another sportswear company called mm-hmm. Kraft. And they were giving me like t-shirts and stuff to raise him. And Dan said in the thing, like, have you got any contractual obligations? And Terry said to me on the phone, he went, look, do you want to talk to him or should I? And I said, I trust you implicitly. You talk to him. So Terry rang him up. And I had a conversation with him and it, and it was to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. Then it went really cold. And I was like, Terry, like, this means everything. Like, I, to me, what I'm trying to do in my life, like this could aid so much to it, Rich, not just as an athlete, but what it allows me to do and what it mm-hmm. represents. And, and it went cold and it, it heated back up. And then they said to Terry, can John come into the London office and do a talk to the staff? So me and Terry go down to Soho and do this talk for an hour. And at the end, there was a hundred of them in there. It was like a little cinema. And they was all sitting down on the aisles and in the chairs. And literally, there was a line of them coming out. And every single one of them shook my hand and they out. And they said, like, it's incredible. And then Dan was standing next to me. And he went, I have seen them. I have seen them being speak, spoken to by some massive athletes. And he went, I have never, ever, ever seen them react to someone like that. And I said to Terry when we left that talk, I said, do you think like that's got me over the line with him. And Terry says, you're in. And then two weeks later, Dan emails back and says, can John come out to the Netherlands and talk at our European conference? It'd be about 850 people from like global. So people from the States were coming to it. Um, so Terry says to me, can you go? I had to ask my probation officer and I said, look, mm-hmm. then Nike want me to go out there. So <laughs> they said, she said, look, you can go. So he cleared yeah. it. I got to the Netherlands. We go to this auditorium the day before where we're going to do a practice run of what we're going to do that day. And then I meet this guy called Edgar and I didn't realize how powerful he was within the brand. So he's head of VP marketing in Europe. So he's one of the most powerful influential men within Nike within Europe. So I meet him and we go for this dress rehearsal. So we're going to open up this massive conference, these 850 people, and it was called the power from within. So it was about normal people achieving extraordinary things no one in this auditorium would know anything about me because no one knew about me in the brand. Mm-hmm. Like, it was all new to them. So we do our dry re- dress rehearsal and then we go out for dinner that night. So we're sitting in this restaurant in Amsterdam and Edgar sitting next to me and he was saying to me, like, do, you know, um, do you know how we sponsored you? So I said, Dan. He said, no. He said, I was reading about you um, at an airport in, in Holland, in Schiphol, and I read this sports supplement and I got halfway through and he put, I put the paper down, I got my phone out and I sent an email to London. I said, find that man and sponsor him. Mm. 
And he was talking to me and he was telling me a story about years before that, when he was a young guy working at Nike, when he first, so he's been in the brand now 32 years. And he said, there was a, an ice skater in Holland, in the Netherlands. And he said, the man was beautiful, charismatic, charming, good looking, outspoken. And I went to the brand and I said about sponsoring him. And at the time, Nike didn't sponsor ice skaters. And he went, I always regretted that we never got him. And the next year he became Olympic champion, European champion. And he went and become this massive superstar in Holland. And I always thought, damn, like, if only if I'd have got him. And he went, I always promised myself, if I ever got to a position in the brand where I could make that decision, I'd make it. And he went, and when I saw you, my heart told me it was the right thing to do. And, and that's how it all sort of come about. Wow. And, and, it, and, and I, when they reached out to me initially, obviously as an athlete, it's the pinnacle. Like I, Lance Armstrong was a massive hero of mine in prison when I read his books, Nike, Michael Jordan, Mo Farah, Paula Radcliffe, all of these endurance athletes that I aspire to be like were all under that brand. And, and to me as an athlete, it meant everything. It meant like me realizing a dream. What I really come to realize, the power that that has, that Nike swoosh, when you go into schools, is unbelievable to young people. And I make a conscious effort. When I go to schools and I talk to young people, I do not scare them into crime, not committing it, because it does not work. Mm -hmm. It's fact. It's been proven time and time again, you can't scare them. But every kid wants to be a Nike athlete. Yes. Or there's a rapper or a musician or an actor that is wearing that. They see that as success. They don't care about Iron Man. They don't care about the records. They see the swoosh. And when you're part of that, you're part of like the England football team, all of these things that these kids are seeing as being successful. And I can demonstrate to them and I don't preach. I just explain. I say, this is a set of decisions I chose to make as a young man. This is what happened. Then at that point, when I decided to do that, this is what's happened. You don't need to do that to achieve your dreams in life. You can do positive things with your life and you can achieve your dreams. That doesn't mean every kid's going to be an athlete, mm -hmm. but that night's swoosh to me was my dream. And I said, if I've managed to achieve that in my life from being that kid that was writ off and spent all those years in prison and I've made my dream become real, you can make your dreams become reality. And the proof's in the pudding. And when you can demonstrate it and show that to those young people, it is such a powerful thing. Like I've gone into assemblies where there's been like six, 700 kids and you can hear the gasps when you turn around at the end and say, and you go, click the slide, last slide, the night swoosh. And they're like, <gasps> and they all like stand up with stand innovation. Like, and it's so powerful to really connect into some of the most disenfranchised young people in the country. Yeah, and it symbolically just underscores the incredible arc of your journey because you are in a situation where, you know, few people get that low and there's, there's few things, you know, more heralded or, or, you know, more coveted than being a Nike sponsored athlete. Like it's just, you know, that point to the, you know, from A to Z is insane. Yeah. <laughs> Even like and beyond that, like, let's not forget the compressed time period that we're talking about here. This wasn't 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. When did you get out of prison? Um, 2012? 2012, yeah, the end. <laughs> it's the end like, of, you know, it's like, that was yesterday, man. Do you know what? I, when, when, when I was writing a book, when, so um, I was fortunate, I got offered an opportunity to write a book and it was really, really sort of, when, when, when I got the opportunity, it was, mm -hmm. it was, it was hard to, to take it because I knew I was going to leave myself wide open to be critiqued and people to criticise, but I knew that book would be a key to a door that would give me a platform to do good with the rest of my life. And, and, I, and I kind of, and it was the reason why I sort of chose to do it. And the ghostwriter that did it with me, um, we, that, we did these sittings. We used to do two sittings every month. And mm -hmm. it, the book was written quite quick. It was written within four months, five months. But we do these sittings and I'd be telling them, and sometimes I have to be quite feeling this review, I would be... I wouldn't be sort of as open with some of the stories to because it embellished stuff. Like I didn't really want to put too much detail in some of the stories because I thought um, I'd be involving other people that I didn't really, I wanted to keep the book all about sort of me and not talk about other people because I knew it could open up Pandora's box of causing me issues later on in my life and stuff. And so I, I was very controlled with, with how the book was written and, and I was very sort of mindful about what I said. And, and I remember like you sit there sometimes and like, you, you could see he was like thinking, really? Like, and then um, and what happened? He, he never met no one else in the story. And then he met Terry. 
And then him and Terry met each other at one of my races. And he was having a conversation with Terry. And he was like, is this for real? And right. Terry was like... So he wasn't buying it. No. He, th- he thought you were full of he, shit. He kind of thought... I think in some ways he thought it was all pre-planned. Like I was a sociopath. Like I was thinking about this uh-huh. later on in my life. Like when I was in prison, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this and do that and do this. Uh-huh. And then he, he couldn't get... Well, I think the thing that he really struggled with was a lot of yeah. people helped me... Um, for nothing. He couldn't get that. He, 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 everything was sort of about money. It was like, but they must have seen, I was, they must have seen something in it. Like there must have been something in it. They must have seen there was an opportunity in them to help themselves later on. I was, no, there wasn't, they, there was none of that. Like Darren mm. didn't do what he'd done all these years ago, thinking that I'd be where I am today. Terry didn't think six years ago where I'd be where I am today. Like, well, what's happened? There wasn't. And, and, I, and, it, and sometimes we would sit there, as I said, do these sittings with him and he generally didn't believe it. And, and then, once he got involved, then what's happened afterwards, he brings me up now. Um, and like he's, my life has never been normal. Like from being a young Clearly. Kid, yeah. It, it hasn't. Not, even I can admit that. Like, some, like Rich, like not many people know this. So um, last year I got invited to the House of Parliament to meet the minister, mm-hmm. to talk about using sport in prisons and in the community to stop kids from making bad decisions, right? The meeting ends. She says to me, would you like to come on the veranda of parliament to come to this boxing event? So I said, yeah. So we walked through. I go to this boxing event and it was a bit of a showcase. It was about more boxing clubs in London to get more kids engaged in sport. Mm-hmm. There was I had all these young GB Olympic boxers. They was all doing a Q&A. Um, there was a young Muslim guy there from Bolton and he wasn't very articulate. Guy said to him, why did you take up boxing? And he went, because I didn't want to be a bum sitting on the streets taking drugs. And he went, when I was a kid, I watched Amir Khan fight at the Olympics when he was 16. And I looked and he was like, at that time, he was eight, nine years old. And he went, when I'm, when I'm that age, I want to go to the Olympics and fight for my country and win a gold medal. Anyway, he went to Rio, he come fourth and he was gutted. And he went, when I go back to Tokyo, I'm going to win a gold medal for Britain. And I thought, this kid is incredible. Like, he's amazing. He's everything what sport is to me. And then I left, and as I was walking out for the car park of Parliament to get a taxi, we were all just screaming, look up. And like from here, 10 feet away, um, I walked straight into the middle of a terrorist, the terrorist attack at Westminster, and, the, and, and I watched the guy get shot dead. And I saw the policeman running towards me and collapse on the floor. And he, obviously, I didn't realise at the time the guy had stabbed him, stabbed him to death. Like I, didn't, I didn't see that part of it. I just saw the guy getting shot. And... And I remember I got locked in Parliament at night. The whole thing was on a lockdown. It was complete, like, you can imagine. All the politicians, we all got put in this, like, room and then we all got locked there to, like, 10 o'clock that evening. And then when I left... And you're actually kind of mentally and emotionally equipped to yeah. handle this in a way that everybody else isn't. Yeah, yeah, but even 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 <laughs> I, even, right, I yeah. like, even when, when it happened, it's because you're in an environment where you don't expect to see what you're about to see. Uh-huh. Um, and, and that was the thing that took me out. But what happened when, when I left that night, I remember they let us out one at a time and they took all our names and addresses and details. And they said, have you witnessed anything? And I said, I saw the guy shoot him. And then they all stopped. And they was like, cause they didn't expect someone, do you know, you just yeah. don't expect the policeman's taking notes from everyone. And then one guy says, you yeah, actually saw it. And he's like, what? So then he took my name and address and he said, oh, okay, we're, we're going to class you as a priority witness. Cause you've actually witnessed the event. And I remember walking out of the Houses of Parliament and it was about half 10, 11 o'clock at night and the streets were dead. Like there was no one walking around. There was cordons and you could, you, you could see blue lights flashing, but there was no sirens. It was dead. And I remember walking out there and I thought there is no way on earth I saw that for no reason. I, there was no way. Like the chances of me being there that moment being with all those Islamic suicide bombers all those years before, listening to that young Muslim kid talk about what sport meant to him and then coming out and then witnessing that, the chances of me being there were so small that I thought, like, I don't believe in God, but I genuinely believe there's something where I was meant to be there and see what I saw because it made me unbelievably driven to continue doing what I'm doing. I I can remember that I, I walked home and... And I, I woke up the next morning and there was a guy that was with me. He was in the army that day and he, he tried to save the policeman's life. And he was a battle trained medic, like 
been to Sanders, been out to Afghanistan, battle hardened. Like he, he, he was a hard man in that regard. And I said to him, there is a reason why me and you were there and saw what we saw to continue doing what we're doing. And he delivers lots of courses into prisons because what I saw that day was a man that was disenfranchised with society, that hated the system. I chose to attack it through taking money from it. He chose to attack it through committing terrorism. But somewhere along the line, he got lost somewhere and someone come into his life and warped his where what he thought was right and wrong. And in my head, I thought that is totally preventable. You can stop that stuff from happening by stopping those people from having that mindset where someone negative can come in mm. and not brainwash them, but completely warp what is right and wrong. Yeah, it begins with the disenfranchisement. Exactly. You know, and if you're too late to address that, it's too late and that stuff happens. But that's a profound awareness. I mean, that synchronicity of events is pretty remarkable. You know, it's almost surprising to hear you say that you don't believe in God, given like what you've experienced and how far you've come. And when events like that, that seemingly don't make sense on paper occur, it's hard for me to hear that and not think that there is a purpose and a plan and some kind of, <clears throat> you know, map laid out for you. Do, you. do you know what, what was, what was quite powerful? I, I did a, a book festival um, last year, like November. And it was in a very affluent area of the country, one of the most expensive places to live. And they invited me to go down and do um, sort of a talk about the book and a Q&A. And I've gone in the room and I said, what's like the demographic for the area? And they went, you probably won't get anyone in, under the age of 60. Uh -huh. Very wealthy, retired, um, very white, middle to upper class. So we, they start letting the guests in and I'm sitting there and I'm looking around at like, all these old people and I'm like, they're, gonna, they're really going to start trying to grill me on the Q&A at the end. And what happened was when we finished, they come up and they were offering me money. They were saying like, we want to give you money, like for what you're doing. <laughs> uh -huh. And, and I was saying, look, I can't take your money, but when my foundation's up, running, yeah, I was you, like, can... you got to have a foundation. Yeah. 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 That's, mm -hmm. that went live um, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, wow. Cool. And I said, look, I can't take money with you. But when it's set up, please, like, um, please donate to it. And, and the money will go to sort of working with young people. And then, um, a priest come up to me and he went, can I ask you something? And I said, what? He said, has your book got a religious connotation to it, redemption? And I said, no. And he said, are you religious? And I said, no. I said, I used to be, but I kind of, I fell out of love with, with I, I grew up as a Catholic, but I, I lost that um, when I went to prison, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why, before I ever used to commit a crime, I always used to pray that I'd get away with it. And I know it sounds like war, well, but I did. I did, like, my stepdad was really Catholic. My nan and granddad, devoutly, um, and I got arrested and I went to prison and that completely and utterly switched me off. I didn't believe in it yeah. from that moment onwards. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he went to me, I have never seen a man put on earth to do what you're doing right now. He went, it's so clear to me. He went, and you might not believe in God, he went, but I believe God's got a bigger plan for you. And, and, and again, I don't, I don't believe but it was quite a powerful moment where I was like, <laughs> that's, 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 it. and he was looking at me and I was like, wow, like I didn't know yeah. really know what to say because it's, it was something so above me where he could quite, he could see something, what I'm trying to do in my life today that I've been put here for a purpose. And I, and I, like I said, like, I, I believe, I don't believe in God, but I do believe things happen for a reason. And I think I was there, what I saw that day. And I think my stepdad coming into my life when I was a kid, the people that I met in prison, um, my stepdad taught me a lot of good things. You, I can't just blame him for sort of warping my perspective of life. He taught me a lot of skills when I was a kid that have aided me as an adult. Um, one was never just hang around with criminals mm -hmm. when I was a young boy. He went, always make sure you mix with different groups of people. And that's allowed me then to be able to converse with different groups of people all the time and not be like, I can only talk to like criminals or I can only talk right. to school kids. Right. Well, I would echo that priest sentiment. Uh, you know, I can certainly understand why uh, your relationship with Catholicism fell out of grace. 
But I think there's a difference between religious dogma and having a spiritual connection to something greater than yourself. And I would certainly, um, you know, echo his thoughts in saying that, that you're on the path that you're meant to be on. It's super inspiring, man. And uh, it's quite a remarkable tale. And we got to land this plane, but I got to know, what's going on with the crime syndicate now? And how's your mom? Um, the crime <laughs> syndicates fell away. Basically, yeah. all of them are Fell in prison. Apart. All of them are in prison. My stepdad's never been out since I went in when I was a teenager. Mm. Do you go and visit? Do you stay in no. contact or you completely? I, just, I, cut, I, cut, yeah. I cut them all out. I cut right. all my, I cut all my um, dad's side of the family out. Um, I see, see my mum's side, but my mum's side were all legitimate. Um, my co-defendant, he got released from prison recently, I found out. Yeah. But yeah, everyone else is, they're either in prison or they're dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and my mum, my mum's good. I see my mum all the time. I'm still really close to her. And she gets all the trophies and medals and everything. I put, mm. They're all around the house in vases. And, but yeah, my mum's mega supportive. And she, I think it's so nice now to make my mum proud of what I'm doing. But my mum was always proud of me. Even when, even when I was in that high security prison unit, I remember she come up and she left one of the visits one day and she said to me, it was one of the only times she saw me in prison, but the first time she was like, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, mum. <laughs> yeah. But she is, she's a, yeah, she, she's your mum. Like, Mum's love you unconditionally and she, she always has. And it's so nice now, like, like when the neighbours say, oh, I saw Jonathan on TV or uh-huh. like the radio or sees me in the magazine, like, she buzzes <laughs> off it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Wow, that's so, it's such an incredible story. And I feel like it's just beginning for you. Thank you, know? you. That's the beautiful thing is like this whole thing is just starting, you know, and I, I see a rich future ahead for you and the opportunity to impact a lot of lives. Thank you. So what is the, to kind of end this, you know, what is the one sort of sentiment that you want to make sure you impart to somebody who might be listening to this, who is struggling or can't find their way forward? You know, I'm not talking about necessarily somebody who's incarcerated, but you know, somebody who just feels stuck in their life and um, is frustrated and, and feels like opportunity has eluded them. I think that you, it, I think it's quite simple. And I know it's just never give up and always believe it can get better because it can. And I think life is so precious and you're alive and you're breathing. And one day we won't. Um, so you're winning the battle because you're still breathing. And I, and, I, and I believe that every day, like there's mm-hmm. days I get up and like, you have a bit of an off day and you just, but you have to be appreciative. I was out on my bike the other day and, I was riding along, I thought, wow, I'm alive and I love this. Life, life's so lovely, it's precious. It's, we're here, the, the chances of us being here right now are, are trillions and trillions of one. You've probably got more chance of winning a lottery a million times over than us actually breathing air. So just be appreciative of it and, and just believe that it can always get better no matter how dark that hole is. You can always get out of it and, and I've done it. And if I've done it, and I, I don't think I'm any different to anyone else. Like if I've managed to do it, anyone can do anything in life. I think that's a good way to end it. Thanks. Thanks for talking to me, man. Thanks, Rich. Um, really incredible. Uh, much luck in the upcoming Ironman. What are the other races you're doing this summer? I'm Challenge Almira in the Netherlands. Uh huh. So and is the uh, is the goal to qualify for Kona, or what's you know what is the kind of longer um, term? Just view to here? finish as high up in the field as I possibly can and yeah. be in the mix of everyone. Right. right and on. try to break that sub three hour marathon in an Ironman. All right. That's cool. been everything. All right, well, come back and talk to me next time I'm in London. Thanks, Rich. Let me know if your parole officer lets you come to LA. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, if you're digging on John, um, the best way to connect with him at John McAvoy, pretty much everywhere, right? And johnmcavoy.com. Yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. And are you ever doing like talks to the public where people can come and see you? Like, do you have a schedule on your website, uh, like, public appearances? Not, not at the moment. I do mostly school stuff, but yeah, mm-hmm. I probably in the future, I'll probably start doing a bit more public speaking in the context of like events. But normally it's either schools, prisons, or maybe sort of business or talks. Right. So and, the, and tell me, remind me the name of the book. Um, Redemption. Redemption. Yeah. And I just to add, all, all, all my author's role is in profits go into school projects. Uh-huh. So, and, yeah. and the, is there a different uh, website for the foundation? Uh, not currently, no. Right, so you so go to my website, but all the information will be on there. Cool. All right, man. Thank Much you. Much love, brother. Take care. All right, peace.